Ignition sequence start. Five, Five four, four, three, three, three two, two, one. Zero. What's new, Charlie? You know that Charlie Stride. Charlie was the first rebel. Charlie, the original. You've fallen in love, Charlie? Which Charlie's your Charlie? You gotta smell him yourself. Then decide what kind of Charlie you are. Kinda young, kinda now, Charlie. Kinda free, kinda wild. Sorry, Charlie. Sorry, Charlie. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> Come on. Now the world belongs to Charlie. Charlie! Guidance is internal. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It feels good. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Happy New Year, everyone. 2024 wanted to talk to you a little bit today about why Georgia Kappelman's closing argument was so hated by Charlie and Donna Adelson. And in reviewing it, for one, she got it right on the nose. It's an amazing closing argument. I think many of us missed it, how good it was, because... Obviously, we didn't have the advantage of the slides and we weren't in the courtroom and it wasn't being presented to us. So we were looking at it with a little bit of distance, but also because we were all so nervous, at least I was so nervous that Charlie's multi-million dollar defense, I would think, I don't know, that is just an estimate, something I... <laughs> if he paid a million or even half a million just for the jury consultant, you would think that Dan Rashbaum would be close to a million plus defense. We thought that maybe we, they would be the jury, at least one juror would be swayed. And we kept hearing reports that there was one juror, thankfully ended up being an alternate was really pro-defense and shaking his head when Georgia Kappelman spoke and nodding his head along when Dan Rashbaum spoke. But why I think this is so hated is because there's so many pieces of circumstantial evidence that put together make a really strong case. And they don't just make a strong case for Charlie Adelson. They make a really strong case for Donna and Wendy. And I wanted to listen to it together. And you can see how much Donna's evidence and what Wendy did is brought up. And if you go back to the phone calls, that's what really bothered Charlie, is that Wendy really messed it up for everyone. That was my impression. Why did she take that turn? Why did she drive to the scene of the murder that day. Why did she have to buy bullet bourbon? All those things Charlie Adelson is telling us are really important and really convincing. That they couldn't have just been coincidences. That a rational <laughs> person who lived on planet Earth would say, there's no way that's just a coincidence that she happened to be driving by the crime scene and was so disinterested in what was going on. Didn't get out of her car, didn't ask what's going on, didn't call the daycare, didn't call Dan. So we t when we think about evidence, or when we talk about evidence in true crime, everyone loves the big pieces of evidence, the really, especially now with DNA, is so looked at as the gold standard that we're supposed to forget everything else. If some DNA or no DNA is found, forget every other piece of evidence. 
because it makes a really good talking point. The DNA showed this. Especially with group crimes. So, but circumstantial evidence is really hard to disprove. All these little pieces of evidence connecting together. And that's why I think it was such a poor choice for Dan Rashbaum, for Rashi, <laughs> to, to hone in on the idea of puzzle pieces. What a poor analogy. Because none of the puzzle pieces fit for Charlie Adelson in this case. And even Georgia Kappelman, you'll see, takes back the puzzle pieces and uses it, uses that analogy for her own. It's, it's really an excellent, excellent closing argument. And I can't wait to get into it. But before I do, just a couple of interesting comments from you guys. Barbie Cat 6352 said, it's easy to print invites. She's talking about the bullet bourbon invite I showed for about a few minutes in last episode and insert a different liquor preference in every few of them. This can be checked out by the host and maybe has already been, but in any case, it doesn't seem this is worth wasting time on obsessing about and seems almost counterproductive because there's so many uh, other evidence against Wendy. Certainly. My concern is that from what I've heard from the jailhouse tapes, that if this were really true, that Charlie Adelson would have just been like, well, she was asked to buy that particular kind. Only Donna was saying that. And very softly, he was saying, why would she buy bullet bourbon? If, the, if that was the explanation, the it just seems so odd, this invite to me. Seems very sus and can't wait for Wendy's trial to get to the bottom of it, Barbie. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll be spending much more time on it unless more information comes out. But I'm not really, I brought it up to show you, to show, to point out some of the reasons why I find it odd. Sa Sarah W. 11.2 says, thank you, Roberta. Can you tell me the story of your logo? Is that a calf? You have a great voice. Thank you. Any chance we could have your face or another visual of your programs? It's just more interesting. Yeah, I have been on camera. It's just a little hard for me to do. There are a lot of episodes on my channel of me on camera. It's just a little hard in this apartment uh, to do, but hopefully I'll figure out a solution. We're trying to talk to my boyfriend about doing a solution. And as for my logo, it is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it's funny you should mention it because I don't know. I don't even know what I would call her, but the woman at the platform for my podcast asked me if I'd look into changing my logo. And so I looked into changing it and I didn't really like any of the new, <laughs> anything better than the logo I already have. But at the time I was thinking about how much, is this too long an explanation? Probably how often things aren't what they seem in these true crime stories and people who are parading around as sheep are really wolves in sheep's clothing. And often you'll hear murderers like Damien Eccles, for one, talked about wolf and sheep and people being sheep. Tenacious P. Georgia says, Georgia hasn't even gotten out of first gear yet, and I cannot wait. You can see the joy in her face, and she's just waiting Brilliant events to come soon, I hope. Yeah, and I can't wait for everybody to see this closing argument again with a little bit more distance. By the way, the opening was by the Society page, and they did that. They made that video, of course, 
before Charlie's trial began. I don't know if how many people, my audience, remember the Charlie perfume commercials, but that's the theme to that. And it's one of my favorite channels, the Society page, and the link is in the description of this video. Highly suggest you subscribe. All right, let's get into this closing argument, shall we? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. May it please the court. Election, we talked about the burden of proof and how it was my burden to prove this case to you beyond a reasonable doubt through evidence. And generally speaking, the defense's job is to poke holes in the evidence and argue that it falls short of meeting that high burden. And we also learned at jury selection that the defense does not have to prove anything. But sometimes if the law enforcement investigation is so thorough and so compelling, that there's really no way to poke holes in the evidence. He has to basically admit his own words, his own text messages. That stuff is undeniable, right? And those things prove that he was in cahoots with Catherine McDaniel in 2013, through the murder in 2014, and all the way up until her arrest in October of 2016. He knows he can't deny that he paid the killers because of this bizarre practice he had of stapling his money. So sometimes when a defendant can't attack the facts or the law, they instead try to explain it away by saying, you can't trust what you're seeing. It's not what it appears to be. It's actually something else entirely. Often, as in this case, the individual explanation, so when you zoom in on one piece of evidence with its attached explanation, can be like, hmm, maybe. But when you zoom out and you add all these things together, this explanation, and this explanation, and this explanation, this coincidence, and this coincidence, and this coincidence, it starts making less and less sense. It starts being less and less reasonable. And when you zoom out from the defense's theory, it's really unreasonable, right? Because to find it reasonable, you have to buy a lot of things that he's selling. The most obvious of which is that because Sigredo Garcia hated him, he and Rivera traveled to Tallahassee twice to kill someone he hated in hopes that he would give them money for it on the back end. Please think about that. To hit this defendant where it hurts, these two dudes with no connection at all to Dan Markell and without two nickels to rub together, rented a car and paid for gas to come to Tallahassee and stay in a hotel twice in order to kill someone that this defendant hated. To harm him. And for what? Did you guys just see Rashbaum's face? Let me see if I can go back just a little bit. He's biting his lip. Someone in the comments talked about him sniffing his fingers. And I must have missed that. <laughs> look at look at him biting his lip while Georgia Kappelman is making a great point. How would Sigfredo Garcia, and we've seen the text messages, I believe they're text messages between him and Katie. Am I right on this? Am I remembering correctly? Where he's like, I don't have... You know, I don't, like he didn't have some kind of small fee for something. I can't remember what it was. And they're going to go to drive seven hours, rent a car to kill someone that Charlie Adelson hated. 
to scare him? What's he going to be like? Good job. Thanks for doing it. And you know how generous his family is. Not. You know, when the bump came, they were like $5,000, not like pay it up, make this guy happy. He knows something right away. They're like considering, listening, talking. I mean, it did just what it was supposed to do, get them talking. Another less tight guilty person might just pay them off right away. $5,000, that's cheap. Compared to my freedom, right away. When can we meet? What is your what is your homie in the prison need? I'm there for them. So look at Rashbaum biting his lip in the back. This is this is the same Rashbaum that we're to believe telling Charlie they're doing so well. Does that look confident to you? Or did he think he was doing so well until Georgia spoke like maybe two sentences of her opening statement? Tell someone that this defendant hated to harm him. And for what? To maybe get money, maybe he just turns him in for murder. Why not just kill and rob him if what you're after is money and there's no hired hit? Why not just kill and rob him if your motive is we hate him? Then the bad guys don't even have any contact with him, according to his own story. They didn't threat him, threaten him. They did not beat him into submission. Instead, they sent his own girlfriend to extort him on their behalf. And without any actual contact from the bad guys, the defendant just opened up his safe and handed over his beloved money that he had saved his entire life since he was a child. He just handed it over. Take it all. And when that amount wasn't sufficient, these stone cold murdering gangsters let the defendant go on a payment plan to give him the rest of the money. They let Catherine Magvanawa skim off the top each month and never over the next two years that he was being extorted monthly, these gangsters, remember that money doesn't go to the principal, that 3,000 a month. They never show up to demand the remaining $195,000 that this defendant has agreed to pay them. Then you also need to find reasonable that over the two years of this supposed extortion layaway plan, that the defendant continued to do what? Did you guys see that? I found it so distracting. So as Georgia Kappelman is making her amazing point, which is that Katie McBanawa, who's what, four foot 11, 115 pounds and nothing, is going to scare Charlie with this idea of these, of Sigfredo at all. Charlie's handing Dan... Rashi a note and Rashi's saying something back to Charlie Adelson and then he's circling something in his notebook and then we get into some now I see some heavy finger smelling <laughs> thank you to whoever made that comment now I see it but Charlie Adelson looks like almost white green here not to take anything away from this amazing closing argument. It was just interesting. You can see, I wonder how many of these kind of notes Charlie passed during this closing argument. So we know that Rashi got a little annoyed and told him he had to stop at one point. Send these kissy faces and love texts to Catherine Manfano. He's sending these messages to a woman who got him into this mess. And he says he didn't suspect she was involved. What? What do we know about this man? He didn't suspect she was involved. She's taking the money. He's never even heard from the bad guys. He didn't see it that way that she got him into this mess. They grew closer after she began extorting him for 3000 bucks a month. Meanwhile, the defendant and Catherine Magbanoa 
break up. She continues to maintain her direct and indirect contact with Secreto Garcia, the man who's extorting him, the man who murdered his former brother-in-law in cold blood. But he sees her as a friend. The kissy faces and the I love yous continue. Even after Catherine Nyvanawa got back together with the man who executed Dan Markell, the father of his young nephews, and who a guy who's actively extorting him, this defendant continued to reach out to her over and over again to offer her favors and gifts, including a birthday gift for Garcia, and to tell her he loves her and how lucky he is to have her in his life. Lucky? Next, to find a reason. Obviously, Georgia Kappelman has never been in love because if she had been in love, she would have known that all great love stories start with extortion. Then the romance really gets hot. <laughs> and then the gifts come, the cruises, especially when you get with, with, a, <laughs> with your ex-baby's ex, uh, daddy. Then, then the gifts really come and you really get closer. How foolish of Georgia Kappelman. Clearly not experienced in these matters. <laughs> reasonable doubt here. You have to find it reasonable that the defendant never texted or talked about this first layer of extortion. Why? According to him, because Catherine Magdalena said, let's never talk about this. So they didn't. Then you have to believe he never reported or revealed this information to law enforcement out of fear of the gangsters. And finally, you have to believe that this living in fear of death by gang members over two years didn't cause a change in his general demeanor that his friends noticed, but later the bump from law enforcement did. He says that's because, well, I became worried that I might be falsely arrested. So I wasn't a hot mess when I was being extorted by gang members and threatened to be killed and my whole family killed. But I became a hot mess when I started to get worried that the cops might be getting closer. So this really interesting question before the show in the live comments, is Donna going to go with the same defense, seeing how poorly it worked for Charlie, that this was all Charlie's extortion. What other defense does she have? I mean, she could not put on a defense and try to poke holes in the state's theories. I, I you know, I think she's cooked. I don't know what I would come up with. And we've seen defense. I, I think it was Georgia Kappelman said, yeah, these defense Lawyers get pretty creative. No truer words have been spoken, but this is why I'm not a defense attorney or even as would ever aspire to be one. What do you do with Donna? You put her on the stand? Try that. So, so is it Mrs. Adelson? Yes, it's Mrs. Adelson. <laughs> you know, like just so unlikable. So, what did you mean when you wanted to dress up the kids in Hitler Youth uh, outfits? I was just kidding. I was just making suggestions. I was trying to be helpful. That's all I was doing, just trying to be helpful. She didn't do it. You can see Wendy didn't do it. Just try that on the stand. Just see how that goes in Tallahassee. And I have no real way of knowing if all this stuff sounds ridiculous to you, if it sounds reasonable to you, or if y'all just heard so much stuff that you're totally confused and can't even remember what the evidence in the case showed. But they only need to get one of you confused enough to derail this whole thing, right? So I've got to go through each thing with you. Your verdict has to be unanimous. So I want to go through the testimony. I want to review the evidence. 
And I want to spend a little bit more time talking about this multitude of explanations the defense has offered in an effort to really turn each piece of evidence on its head. This is Dan Markell. He is the victim in this case. A brilliant lawyer, a funny guy, a son, a colleague, a brother, a mentor, and a friend. But most of all, a father. A dedicated and loving father whose downfall was brought about by the fact that his number one priority was maximizing his assets access to those two little boys in the wake of a bitter divorce from their mother. And despite the defense's efforts to characterize their client as the real victim here, Dan Markell remains the only victim in this case. The only thing he was guilty of is fighting like hell for those kids. And he lost. He didn't lose in court, but he lost. This is what he looked like before this defendant hired a hitman to kill him. And this is what he looked like afterwards. The evidence has shown that on July 18th, 2014, this brilliant man was gunned down in broad daylight in the driveway of his own home. His horrific death ultimately set police down two separate paths following the two most promising leads they had. The first, was to chase down that Prius that Mr. Geiger saw fleeing the crime scene. And we'll examine those efforts in detail. The second path was to ask, as we would in any murder investigation, who might want to have done this? Who would want Dan Markell dead? And the only people that wanted Dan Markell dead and really had issues with him were the entire Adelson family. Listen, Listen to how much this close, closing is about the entire Adelson family, minus Harvey. Not mentioned too much, if ever, in this close, closing that I remember, but Donna and Wendy are mentioned a lot, and you can hear Charlie's complaining about it. Oh, it was my mother's stupid emails. It was Wendy taking that turn and driving by the crime scene. It was her buying bullet bourbon. Yeah, because it's all so damning. It all makes sense as a group. And it doesn't make sense to me that this family did this without Wendy's knowledge, because as I've said a hundred million times before, that's not a gift you give. If that gift goes badly, oh, you didn't want that, Wendy, but you said you hated him. Oh, you can't undo it now. Too bad. Boy, that would have caused a riff in this family. And she had to know going down to Miami, what she's supposed to, she goes down to Miami. The lawyer calls and says, we're not cooperating. What a coincidence that the whole family's not cooperating with the investigation. And if you talk to them, they'd say, oh, well, it's because we know how easy wrongful convictions can happen. I mean, Charlie Adelson has uh, this whole wrap down from the wrongful conviction movement. The jury was terrible. They were out to convict me on no evidence, no evidence at all, just a feeling just on my unlikability. No evidence was presented at, at this trial. Boy, that was, a, that was a long trial for no evidence presented. So I think it's really interesting that she, Georgia Kappelman rightfully hones in on the fact that Charlie Adelson is trying to make himself the victim and still is. And I think that's one of the reasons why he hates this closing so much is it gets correctly, the story gets focused on Dan Markell being the victim, not Charlie Adelson can't handle that. Listen to his phone calls. He barely says, they're like, hi, how am I? They're all about Charlie Adelson. He never, ever talks about what's going on with anyone else or even asks. Very seldom, if ever. It's a one-man talkathon 
of of Miathon, totally. And within one hour of the shooting, before Professor Markell was even pronounced dead, this path was already pointing to the defendant. When his sister revealed to law enforcement that her family hated Dan Markell and that her brother, Charlie, had joked about hiring a hitman to kill him. And this trash talk, of course, would be meaningless had he not been killed by a hitman. So who did it appear had a motive to want Dan Markell dead? His own family. And what offense had Mr. Markell committed against these people? Refusing to let his children be taken away from him? Objecting to them disparaging him to his kids. The evidence has shown that the Adelson family was all about psychological warfare. And when all else failed, they were willing to go even further to win. I want to examine and one of the interesting things about Donna's emails that she really hones in on is that Dan really outshone Wendy. And Donna was talks about Harvard this and Harvard that. Like it's <laughs> like his, his Harvard undergrad and postgrad degree are nothing. She knows they're not nothing, but she says things like he thinks he's so important and great. So he was a threat to, you know, the Adelson family sees, sees themselves as royalty. Their status. And you would think that it would be like a feather in their cap to have, right. To have him as a part of their family, but no, they started this psychological warfare at the wedding when they decided no kosher food, we're going to have it our way. And this is the way your marriage is going to be from then on. And Wendy Adelson hasn't stopped attacking Dan Markell. He didn't get that job because, of course, she had to come as part of it. And they didn't want Wendy, the job in Miami. She can't can't accept that, of course, because she's so narcissistic. But she keeps on, I wasn't in love with him. I mean, why? Why say these things? Because she wants to totally erase the memory of Dan Markell. It's not enough to just have a taken part, in my opinion, in the conspiracy to have him murdered, which is the same as being pulling the trigger. She has to kill whatever's left of his legacy, change the, change the kids' names, change the kids, one of the kids' middle names. It's so extreme. This motive in more detail and look, exact, look at exactly how it's attributable to this defendant. Despite the defense efforts to minimize this, it's really clear that the divorce between Wendy and Danny was a particularly nasty one. They fought over everything, all the way from the children down to the bicycle and the tennis racket. In January of 2013, Wendy Adelson filed a motion to allow her to relocate to South Florida with the kids. They were two and three at that time. As one basis for this request, Wendy cites the wife's parents reside in Coral Springs and the wife's brother resides 20 minutes away. The children are very close to the wife's parents. Wendy Adelson also alleges in this filing that the husband has al also created a hostile work environment for the wife at FSU School of Law. Wendy Adelson viewed herself as stuck in Tallahassee, a characterization which she now denies, but one which was used to describe her situation by Jeffrey Lacoste on the witness stand and also in her own pleadings in these divorce filings. In Markell's answer on page 80, he seeks continued equal time sharing in Tallahassee. He seeks sole parental responsibility on issues related to the education, religion, 
and medical upbringing of the kids. Then we go to this May email from Donna Adelson to Wendy. These emails are offered as examples of how invested Donna Adelson was in this litigation and in Wendy's life in general. They revealed that relocation was a huge priority for Donna and that it was also a high priority for Wendy, Harvey, and the defendant as well. Wendy testified that her mom really wasn't that involved in her. Here, I don't think Georgia Kappelman is considering the power of Donna Adelson's banana bread. Apparently, that banana bread has magical powers to heal these kind of rifts. If only the banana bread had been cooked earlier and given to Danny earlier. And the hug, too. I think is is the combined power of the banana bread and the hug. That must be some banana bread. What a thing to make up, right? Well, well, she Donna made him banana bread and all was forgiven. So there goes the the divorce that was compared to World War II by Donna. But these emails, I really encourage everyone to read them for themselves. The link is in the description of my last episode, and you can read all of them. And they really paint a portrait. I mean, we talk about, or we hear a lot about Danny's filings where he's referencing other legal issues and how obsessed he was. I, don't, I mean, Donna, not, I mean, she was thinking of everything. Christianity, Christianity and Catholicism and fully, and as a way to get, get into the judge's good favor, which I really, I think supports my feeling that these are really some self-hating Jews. And I, I am culture, uh, three quarters Jewish. I was raised Quaker, but I would never ever consider dressing up anyone in a Hitler youth outfit for any reason. And I think most Jews would agree with me on that. Divorce proceedings. Again, these emails prove the opposite was true. It, on May 3rd, 2013, this email references Dan's divorce filing as, quote, his 23-page rant. She then crystallizes the importance of relocation, stating, the most important part of your divorce is relocation, in bold. I sincerely hope that your attorney understands this is your all caps non-negotiable. She needs to hear from you how serious you are about this and how it will benefit the children with a close-knit family support system as well as your significantly better paying job. But on June 21st, 2013, Wendy's motion to relocate was denied by the court, with the court finding that the wife has not met her burden of proof that a relocation is in the best interest of the minor children. Like the heroine in her book, Wendy and the boys were officially stuck in this small stop on the way to what we had previously known as civilization. Wendy worked hard to try to convince you that none of this was a very big deal to her, her mother or her brother. And she said she was expecting to win everything in the divorce. She was expecting Danny to lose everything in the divorce. She was partly right. Danny did end up losing everything, but not in court. She had already lost relocation and her attorney had to get off the case as a result of whatever Danny was filing in court. And he was poised to really take her through the ringer with this grandma motion, the fraud allegation and the contempt motion that was all pending. Even if he wasn't gonna be successful folks, it was going to be a very unpleasant ride for Wendy Adelson. But as we have learned, Gibbers hadn't beaten the Adelson family yet. On the stand, Wendy Adelson suggested that relocation was not a big issue for her. It was just suggested by a friend, but the other evidence in the case suggests the opposite. Jeffrey Lacoste said she was a complete mess over the litigation, especially the relocation. 
She wrote a book about a human rights attorney who was stuck in a small town in the Florida Panhandle because of her hapless Canadian professor husband's job at NFSU. And maybe most importantly, Wendy filed this motion for relocation. Um, excuse me, Georgia Kappelman. Did you not just hear Wendy's testimony that that character Lily was based on her friend? So that so you're talking about the her friends, Wendy's friends husband, the per, the Canadian professor in, the, in, in a Florida town who's in a loveless marriage. Just, just, I mean, let's get accurate here. Just for Charlie's sake, look at Charlie in the back there. Look how unhappy he looks. And Dan Rashbaum pursing his lips in the back. Oh, they hate this. Great closing. Her lawyer didn't file it without her knowing. Was the motion doomed from the start? Wendy clearly hoped not. But there were other ways to skin the cat. Here's a June email from Donna to Wendy. In response to the court order denying relocation, Donna emails Wendy, quote, it's time for action. It's time to take control of your life and not let Gibbers think he's won anything by having you remain in Tallahassee, eight hours away from the only family you have. Let's show this F point point point. What will make him absolutely miserable? And later, the rest of your life, and consequently, dad's, mine, and yes, even Charlie's, will be affected by how well you can perform slash act before July 31st. You can be a good actress when you want to. I've seen you in action. You need to put on the performance of your life. Jibbers hasn't beaten the Adelson family yet. Then on June 25th, this is continued that same email, we get a plan of action. Take a photo of the boys dressed nicely, standing at the front door by the sign of the Tallahassee church. They're Jewish, remember? Then change your Facebook status to this one so everyone will see this. Perhaps a line under the photo with new beginnings in Tallahassee might be nice. Hmm? How happy do you think you will be? Make arrangements to get the boys caught up with a private tutor at the teenage Catholic church who will come to the house to teach the young men about Jesus. If you don't have time to arrange this, I'll be happy to do it for you. Let Jibbers know that your children will be baptized in the Catholic church and you'll certainly invite him to the event. I've already checked this out, and the baptism can be arranged within two weeks. We can send out e-bites to Jibbers, his parents, sister, and anyone else you want to invite. Four, I'm looking into summer camp programs for the boys. We will pay for it, even if the boys end up only going for the few days that they're in Tallahassee with you. Five, register them for toddler classes at the church. I've looked into this, too. Even if they don't actually go, we can show Jibbers that they are enrolled for the fall semester. And you cannot tell anyone this is an act. Take control from him. Get to him psychologically. He's going to want you to stop this. So Jibbers hasn't beaten the Adelson family. This is all about Donna and Wendy here. It's going to be so interesting to see see Donna's defense answer these emails. You know they're coming into evidence in her trial. What would you say? I mean, what is a good what is a good answer to to this? Yes, yes, we were at war and he just coincidentally got murdered right at a crucial time in the divorce. I mean, I don't know. And what else is on her phone? The phone that she was wrestling with in the jet away on her way to Vietnam in her non-extradition country. I, mean, I think the evidence is much stronger against 
Donna now, thanks to thanks to Donna herself. Because you can't say, I mean, what she's going to say, I guarantee you, is once I saw Charlie get wrongfully convicted, I knew I was next. And she, we know she, from her own words, she was talking to Rashi, and Rashi was about what they were thinking up there in Tallahassee. Meaning Rashbaum was tipping her off to the grand jury about to meet, about to indict her. And unfortunately, she knew she might be stopped. That's the advice Rashbaum gave her. They might stop you at the airport. But she thought it was going to be, she was going to be arrested and Harvey. But we know it was just Donna. I don't know if Harvey's ever going to see any kind of charges for this. You have one final opportunity to make him angry. We want him ticked off. So he realizes that he could lose control over his kids. We want, we plan to make a financial offer to him to allow this relocation. You need to work this plan and we'll help you through it so that it may affect how much we offer him. Maybe he's willing to let you relocate if he knew his children could attend this private Hebrew academy. Or perhaps he he'd like them to invite him to a Christmas party at their other Sunday school. Let's get this going now. I know you would never want to think that you didn't do absolutely everything you could to come down to your family. Dad and I have changed our lives this year to support you and assist you and the boys in every possible way. Charlie has accepted the loss in the office business income for us to do this because he loves you and wants only the best possible future for you. It's time for you to show us that you can put on the performance of your life for the next few weeks. And then on June 27th, she follows up with another email along the same lines, criticizing the judge and Wendy's attorney for and adding, obviously the court isn't out to help you. It's clear since Judge Hobbs' last ruling that she could care less about anything you have to say on your behalf. You need to help yourself. You know, Wendy, most of the wars that have been fought for the last couple of thousand years have been fought over religion. These emails are such telling glimpses into the family dynamics behind this murder. This email is just an example of how relentless Donna Adelson was. And it's clear from these emails that she's conferring with the defendant on these plans that she's proposing. Charlie brought up a good point when he said that Americans were dropped behind enemy lines during World War II wearing a Nazi uniform. So she's conferring with the defendants, but these are all emails to Wendy. Yeah, they mentioned Charlie, but Wendy, I mean, What I'm wondering listening to this is does Georgia Kappelman think that Donna is the driving force behind Dan's murder and will she feel okay ending the prosecutions at Donna? I hope not. I hope it doesn't end there because it's going to be really strange to have Wendy walking around a free woman who benefited the most from this and who clearly was the one so unhappy. And this was her problem. This is Wendy's problem. That's how this was the solution. To get what they wanted. They had a job to get done and they did what they needed to accomplish it. You have a job to get done in a very short time frame to accomplish it. If you dress the kids up in Hitler youth uniforms and brought them down here, I could care less if it was an act of defiance that would show Jibbers that he's not in control. Why not stand up to this fucker? Why not fight? That's all this is, Wendy, an act, an act of defiance that will put a scare into this jackass. It will infuriate him. You need to see the big picture. You need to look into the future of what a life without your only family nearby teaching in Tallahassee with Danny always in the picture will give you. 
it's not a pretty picture. Not everything one has to do in life is comfortable or easy. The extremism that Jivers is already teaching the boys is nothing more than brainwashing. Religion is brainwashing, control the masses. I don't think you realize the type of offer we're considering. We're planning on you, Charlie, Dad, and I going as high as equal parts in a $1 million offer. That's $333,000 from each of us. We're a team. We can't do this without your help. You've already lost relocation according to the legal system. Well, it is about winning and losing. We're trying to get a win. You deserve it. You deserve so much more than a life without family teaching in Tallahassee. Even though the divorce was final on... Not for nothing, but I don't think it was missed by the jury that Donna just said, we need a win. So the ultimate way to win in this, in this case was to murder... Dan Markell, and we know that they saw it that way because they had a big celebration dinner. I mean, just what a scary, morally bankrupt family this is. And it's really like a horror movie marrying unknowingly into this kind of family. On July 31st, 2013, <clears throat> The anger and bitterness associated with this split was still festering. Litigation continued and even increased as both parties filed motions over the next several months, alleging that the other was violating the marital settlement agreement and both parties seeking to have the other side held in contempt of court. In October of 2013, Wendy filed a motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement and have Dan held in contempt. Dan was hearing, and the defendant was hearing about all of this as it went on from his mother, as indicated in the emails and in the text messages shown here as well. Here she's telling him how terrible things are for Wendy and how it's negatively affecting his dad's health. Then later that month, when Wendy was about to make the second dumbest mistake of her life after marrying Dan Markell, by buying a house in Tallahassee. Charlie says Wendy probably hasn't mentioned it to him because it's stupid. And then after he gets Wendy to pull the plug on the house, he's praised as the miracle worker that solved this problem. This text was sent <coughs> on Halloween of 2013, the very day that Catherine Magdalena testified this defendant broached the subject to her of, hey, do you know anybody that could rough somebody up? The defendant was here. That's really interesting. So what Georgia is saying there, she's saying that when Charlie got Wendy to not buy that house in Tallahassee, who knows if she was ever really going to buy that house in Tallahassee? But when he got when he got his mother's like a little taste of his mother's gratitude and enthusiasm, that's when he started to inquire with Katie. Like he wanted more of that. It's really interesting how much Donna withholds this kind of uh withholds her approval and her gratitude from Charlie. And we know that he was really, of all these kids, the least smart, the least capable. And he's very aware, I, I think, as an antisocial personality, what people think of him. He has to be. Which blows my mind that he couldn't read the jury until Monday. He said it was only Monday, right around when the verdict came in, and closing arguments, I think, were happening, that the jury couldn't look him in the eye. 
I mean, I just can't believe he convinced, but this family is always thinking positively. So when they, when Wendy testified, she thought she was going to win everything. There's part of me that wonders if that's what Donna was telling her. She clearly had to have a more common sense than Charlie, though. I mean, it wasn't just the kids and Tala and the fact that she lost when it came to relocation. She had her law license on her on the line, her whole career, her whole sense of self, her whole status in life. If that was taken away, what? I mean, the public shame? I don't think she could take the public shaming. Hearing about Wendy's situation regularly from Donna. Here we see Donna telling the defendant how angry at Wendy's attorney and stressed out Wendy is. That's on February 15th of 2014. And here's another text from, the, from Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson four days later discussing the details of Danny's actions and expressing how much she hates him. Do we have to read this for the people at home? This is Donna. Um, so this is Donna to Charlie. Um, if you speak to Wendy today, tread lightly. Don't ask, don't ask questions about the depot or lawyer, et cetera. Tough time. And she's really stressed out. The asshole showed up at soccer yesterday. And when she tried to leave with the boys, he said, no, stay here and play with Abba. She to the boys that Abba had to leave. And he said, no, I don't. Of course, she woke up to another email from him telling her that she is lying to the boys about her father's whereabouts and that this will be brought before the court. Such a, it's, it's sorry, something was Wendy's day. He is allowed to attend the children's activities, but that's where it ends. Okay, so that's for the people at home. Donna, totally hysterical over a small moment at soccer. Crazy. Here on March 4th, 2014, we have Donna planning to speak in private with the defendant while she's at the rest stop in Gainesville. She asks him to delete this message after he reads it. Although he's not with Harvey, and Harvey nor his birthday are mentioned in this text message. All that's mentioned in this text message is, I'm gonna pull over at a rest stop and talk to you in private. This is the grandma motion. On March 26, 2014, less than four months prior to this murder, less than four months prior to this murder, the defendant files his grandma motion, the counter motion for enforcement of marital settlement agreement on parenting issues and motion for contempt and sanctions. Again, alleging that Wendy is not facilitating communication between he and the kids and getting after Donna personally. In this filing, Dan Markell alleges that on three separate occasions in November of 2013, the children informed him of their maternal grandmother, Donna Adelson, disparaging him. The boys indicate that, quote, Grandma says you're stupid. She says you are trying to take her sunshines away from her. And, quote, Grandma says she hates you. Dan Markell requests the court, quote, enjoin the former wife from allowing the maternal grandmother to have unsupervised time with the children and to impose appropriate limitations to safeguard the children from being subjected to disparaging comments about their father. Contrary to what Wendy Adelson told us, we learned this issue was taken seriously by both sides, and that Dan Markell was particularly hot at the time of his death, 
because of some recent issues that were going on. So to the extent that there was any banana bread peace offering made, it apparently fell short of diffusing the issues within this family. This situation was a pressure cooker and it was about to blow. As we learned, this grandma motion was never decided by the court because Dan Markell was murdered before it could be heard. Whether or not... I think Georgia is hugely underestimating how good that banana bread is. Clearly, she's never had Donna's banana bread because... We, as we know, it mends all, 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 all trouble between people. Uh, that is a coincidence in timing. Is up to you all to decide. Wendy told you that she and Dan were getting well, getting along pretty well at the time, leading up to the weeks leading up to his murder. But this assertion does not fit with the rest of the evidence in this case. In fact, her own court filings are completely contrary to that assertion. In addition, her boyfriend at the time, Jeffrey Lacasse, told you all that she took all of this very seriously, that she became upset every time there was a filing, and that her behavior became increasingly emotional and erratic as the time led closer and closer up to what ultimately was the murder day. According to Lacoste, she was especially concerned about the relocation issue. And Stephen Webster, he was Professor Markell's attorney, testified, told us that Markell was irate at the time of his death over two issues. The first being Wendy enrolling one of the kids in a school without consulting him. And the second one being him overhearing Donna Adelson refer to him as stupid on a recent Skype visit that he had with the boys. So this was far from the peaceful situation that Wendy was trying to sell you. Why was she trying to sell you that? Was she trying to protect her brother? She even told law enforcement at her interview on the day of the murder that she wanted everyone held accountable for this to the fullest extent of the law. Unless. Unless, I'm gonna leave it on a, Cliffhanger, I'm just going to stop it here for a second, take a quick break. Are you guys finding this interesting? Or I'm just curious as to how you're taking it. And thank you so much, Shaggy, for the super chat. Your impersonation is great. Thank you. Donna, I mean, can you imagine that's your mother? Donna's your mother? I mean, we have all these images of like a loving mother. I'll talk to mom when I'm upset and that's your mother. Like the enforcer, like this pushy, crazy, <laughs> out of control with all the wrong value, you know, has all the wrong values in life. Woman, can you imagine Yeah. So, yeah, I just can't even imagine. And I can't even imagine her trial. It's going to be so wild. I cannot wait. I mean, it's going to be like, I mean, Charlie Adelson kept making all these sports references and that, that his trial was like the Super Bowl because, of course, for everything, the Adelsons, they're the top, top tier of everything. Everyone wants to be them. Everyone's jealous of them. No one's smarter, better. And his trial was the Super Bowl of Tallahassee. Well, what's bigger than the Super Bowl? I don't know. But that's, I mean, Donna's trial for me is going to be like Christmas, my birthday, everything rolled into one. I cannot wait for that. Please, Donna, take the stand. Please, please. That's that's I'm putting it out into the universe now. I cannot wait for that testimony. I mean, just have her explain the emails. Have her explain the emails. Just all right. I'm gonna take a quick, quick break, rest my voice when we get back. More of Georgia Kappelman. And oh, by the way, for those of you who love Georgia Kappelman, I have the Facebook group, the Georgia Kappelman Appreciation Society. 
open to all who love Georgia Kappelman. And it's just to discuss the case and the prosecutors who prosecuted the all the defendants in this case on Facebook. Check it out. All right, I'll be back in a second. Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of My True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Hey, back to Georgia Kappelman's amazing closing argument. And I... It, it's so interesting also, I find so interesting is Donna Adelson's total faith in Dan Rashbaum, how much she loves him. I couldn't have I I couldn't have wished for anything better. He was wonderful. Perfect. Perfect closing argument. The closing argument that was like an hour too long in my opinion. And I remembered it as two and a half hours and it's like an hour and 45 minutes. It wasn't any, I don't think much longer, maybe a little bit longer than George's. It felt like it went on forever, forever. And I love, I live for this kind of stuff. I love trials. I, w I was so bored by the end. And he's even making jokes at the end, like I'm going to close, you know, close and pretty soon, and the jury's laughing. So you had to know the jury felt that way, that uncomfortable laugh, like, thank you. Please shut it, Rashi. We can't take much more of this. And why go with puzzle pieces? What a dumb analogy. All right, I've always said that. I'm getting to be like Donna and my repeti <laughs> repetitive points. It was her the defense seems to be telling you the litigation between Danny and Wendy was not a very big deal because minimizing the litigation minimizes the motive for the Adelson family to want Dan Markville dead. They even called Wendy's attorney to tell you that relocation was a lost cause. But what she actually said was, yes, I lose most of these motions, but in this case, I actually thought there was a chance because of some of the surrounding circumstances. Then I thought, well, maybe they called her to say the divorce was routine. But what she actually said was this case was odd. That was her word, mainly because Dan Markell came after her personally, forcing her to withdraw from the case, which had never happened before. So what her testimony proved was that this was not a routine, run-of-the-mill divorce proceeding. It was one of her more difficult cases. And she didn't even have Donna in her ear like the defendant did. So the motive was clearly there. The question then becomes, was the defendant successful in distancing himself from that motive in your eyes as jurors? He says that the litigation had no impact on his life. The emails suggest otherwise. He's included on these texts. He's all over the wiretap meddling in Wendy's life with Donna. Could the defendant have cared enough about his sister's marital problems to commit murder? Maybe, maybe not. But if he didn't, his mom certainly cared enough for the both of them. And she was in his ear all the time. In defendant's own words, you can't have a miserable mom. To illustrate this point, I refer you back to the emails and to that phone call that I played that happened before the bump, where Donna <laughs> and the defendant are discussing this boyfriend of Wendy's at that time, Dave. This call, along with the call about Wendy taking a particular job, which is also on that same exhibit, I think it states 130, was offered as examples to show you how the dynamics work in this family. Wendy appears to be the weakling of the pack. 
She needs to be protected. She needs to be helped. She needs to be coddled. She needs to be saved by Donna and the defendant. Donna is the overbearing matriarch who nags everyone to death about whatever it is that's currently on her. I call it the wheel. The wheel is turning all the time, right? And Wendy getting away from... The wheel's turning all the time. That, absolutely. No kidding. Isn't that interesting, though, that Wendy said, she's like, well, I think all divorces are unpleasant. I mean, and then and then Charlie's wasn't that Charlie's witness who testified that Dan Markell went after her personally? Weren't there two witnesses? Wendy's for the defense, Wendy's divorce lawyer who had to recuse herself after Dan Markell went after her for helping or knowing that Wendy had falsified records and in, in her divorce papers. That's the allegation. And Charlie and Charlie's amazed that he was lo uh, that he lost that no one else backed up his story. Thank you so much, Dr. Zap. Dr. Zap, thank you, Dr. Zap, <laughs> for the very generous super sticker. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Miss, Miss Lisa. Just joined your Georgia Kappelman page. Thank you. AKA Queen Georgia. Yeah, I think the same too. You know, she's tried so many murder cases. There's a podiatrist case that there's an interview up on Deep Dive True Crime from a couple years back with Queen Georgia. And she was saying back then that she had tried a bunch of murder cases. And here she is. She's up against Dan Rashbaum, who I believe has never tried a case like this, never tried a murder case. She's just excellent. Excellent. And, oh, thank you very much, Miss Lisa. Miss Lisa. Very generous. I appreciate it. I get so wrapped up in these, in these talking about these trials. But I just think she's really, really effective, very likable, and very creative, and asks a lot of questions that I don't expect of witnesses, and comes at it in such a sensible way. How do you, I mean, she just demolished this team, and she's not getting paid the big bucks that Rashbaum's getting paid and his jury consultant and all that. I wonder if they had any other experts. You don't hear Charlie Adelson talking about any other experts. Like, you can get experts that help you testify. Anybody seen The Staircase? Remember that expert who helps? Michael Peterson testify. They think he might testify. He ultimately doesn't wisely. But... You know, they're doing like breathing exercises. It's like a full theatrical, like a full drama coach for, for the defendant's testimony. Because, of course, if you're lying on the stand, you better be a pretty good actor or actress. Dan Markell in Movie to South Florida was <coughs> number one on the wheel. It was the top priority in 2013 and in 2014. And this defendant fancied himself the savior of this family. Equal parts black sheep and mama's boy, he would often try to help Wendy at Donna's bidding. When a problem was re perceived regarding Wendy's love life, AKA this breaking up with Dave situation, shouldn't break up with Dave, Dave's a great guy. Donna enlists the defendant to go in and fix it, to solve the problem. When Wendy didn't know what was best for her regarding a job opportunity, Donna sent the defendant to fix it. And the evidence has shown that Dan Markell was a major problem for Wendy, and that meant he was a major problem for Donna, who in turn made Dan Markell a major problem for this defendant. 
because the family all rallied around the idea of hating Dan. I think it was Jeffrey Lacasse who said that that was the family's pastime. Those are my words, not his. Like it was their hobby, hating Dan. And it's just very cult-like. And so they're all united. They all have a mission to hate Dan. And I think I might do an episode a little bit about why I think that was. Oh, thank you, Wood Al. Hold on one second. My boyfriend's just handing me a thing saying I, I need to thank you. Thank you very much. Crowdsourcing Adelson sociopathy. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm not, yeah, very odd, like, just, right, like, what would you, what would, are you saying that, I'm asking, what would the defense be for Donna, like, what would you, I don't know, is that what you mean, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Wood Al, it's just so crazy that they're so cult-like, and that, of course, keeps Charlie really close to Donna. And it also has the added benefit when you have, when you, when you all kind of share the same worldview and the same values and the same way of seeing it. We've heard it in the calls. It, then you, then within your little bubble, you've made a new reality. Because all you're hearing is one side. You don't hear any other side. There is no other side. The other side is bad, wrong, not to be listened to. And as we know from the way they treated Rob, they didn't have any feelings of morality. That was to be laughed at. Like, that's for suckers. Giving back change for suckers. This family liked getting over, liked enacting revenge, liked winning. They saw this and they did not care for losing. Not, I mean, no one likes losing, but this family really was obsessed with winning and status. And that was totally the things that mattered to them in life. Money, status, power, revenge. What a family. Nightmarish. Inner Catherine Magdanova who had connections to a criminal element, and she presented an opportunity to the defendant to do what he does and solve this problem. On Halloween 2013, the defendant began the process of soliciting Catherine Magbanawa to commit murder. Magbanawa solicited Garcia, Garcia brought in Rivera. So if the seed of this conspiracy was planted in the spring of 2013, when Donna was looking into converting the kids to Christianity or making this million dollar offer to Dan Markell, it took root that summer when the re relocation was denied and the defendant began, quote, looking into all options to solve the problem of Danny Markell, including hiring a hitman. And the conspiracy grew further still when Dan Markell filed that motion to preclude Donna from having unsupervised contact with the grandparents, the grandma motion. And as Wendy Adelson relayed to Jeffrey Lacoste just five days before the murder, she was never going to be able to move to South Florida unless something happened to Danny. This conspiracy spread when the... So I have a question for you guys. So do you think that it, Donna was just interested in grandparenting these kids when they were little and cute and when they got to be pre-teenagers, she was totally comfortable with abandoning them and saving herself? Or And thank you very much, Sharon. Thank Gio for keeping this case alive. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So do you think that 
Or do you think she would have saved herself and gone to Vietnam, even if, say, it were earlier in the case and they were little? Just a question. Question for you. All right, back to Georgia Kappelman's amazing closing argument. The defendant met someone who could actually get this thing done. Someone who was in a position of trust in his life, a person who had connections to the kind of people who, for a price, were willing to point a gun at a complete stranger and pull the trigger. And guess what wasn't a problem once Dan Markell was dead? Relocation. Within a couple days, Wendy and the kids moved to South Florida. She changed the names of Professor Markell's children from Markell to Adelson. And just like that, <coughs> their father was erased. No more squabbles over kosher diets or visitation status as a felon and a gang member are definitely things you should consider when you're weighing his testimony in this case. But please consider that his resume as a bad guy was precisely why he was selected to do this gruesome job. Rivera's gang status made him a more attractive... Oh, Sharon, now I know what you mean. You meant Georgia. Georgia, thank Georgia, yes. Queen Georgia. And can you imagine being caught on the surveillance too? I mean, they certainly started with some of the, I mean, this is some of the ironclad stuff being caught on surveillance. The car, all this evidence is so, so damning for Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia. But I believe the Adelsons paid for his Sigfredo for sake, Fredo Garcia's lawyers. How did? He, how else would he afford that that kind of lawyer? And and want to fight this? Why? You know, the smartest one was Rivera, and now he's asking for them to commute his sentence since he's testified so successfully in this and so to have his when his federal sentence ends he doesn't want to go to a state facility because he's worried about his safety but as we know from charlie he'll probably be in the same kind of area that charlie's going to be in which is people who leave gangs snitches and people who really aren't equipped or for her prison life or are really prone to extortion like Charlie. And I don't know if that will save him from really having a real extortion in, in prison in real life. Attractive candidate to do this murder with Garcia. In the hot tub in March of 2014, the defendant mentions his connection to a Cuban criminal element. Jeffrey Lacoste reported this within a couple days of the murder when he couldn't have known the ethnicity of the killer. The evidence has shown that the connection the defendant had was through Catherine McBanawa, and the criminal element was, of course, Garcia and Rivera. And we know that at the time defendant made that statement in the hot tub, the plan to kill Dan Markell was already well in the works. That statement... Not for nothing, but what the heck is... Dan Rashbaum doing with a pen in his mouth. Does he think that's a good, good look? And it's been there for the last 30 seconds or so. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it's been more like 15 seconds. But what is he doing? Does he think that's a good look? He's like, I'm a busy lawyer. I, I'm a real tough lawyer. I, when, when, I, when I'm not working with one pen, I got another one at the ready in my mouth. Ready, ready to write down my brilliant, my brilliant ideas. Is that, is that, what is he doing back there? What is going on? And it was made just three months before the killer's first trip to Tallahassee in June of 2014. The statement reveals that the defendant wasn't scared of Catherine Red Van Watt and her associates. To the contrary, he was boastful. He was bragging about it. 
He was the big man who was going to solve his little sister's problem, make his mom proud, and get away with it because he was thinking of everything. And he later would say and call JJ that nothing was done improper. And said, To whoever left me that comment about the finger sniffing, I have to thank you and not thank you at the same time because now I can't unsee it. Now all I see when I see is Rashi is the finger sniffing. <laughs> so you were right on target with that comment. But did you just see what happened there? Let me see if I can go back a second. Just in the background is so weird. Charlie Adelson is handing Rashbaum something very distracting. And Rashbaum is laughing. Just check this out. Because he was thinking of everything. And he later would say and call JJ that nothing was done improper and suggest that no evidence could be available to tie the killers to him or his family. And he was confident enough of this to brag about it in that hot tub setting, which he thought could never come back to him. He was untouchable. Because if push ever really came to show, who are you gonna believe? An oral surgeon? This is really rude to do, to move that much, to talk to your client, because a person will look at any kind of movement, and it's right behind Georgia, right to Georgia Kaplan's left, if you're a juror. Really distracting. If you don't want Georgia Kaplan to do that kind of behavior during your closing you would hope that Rashbaum wouldn't do this, but I mean, you, what I'm thinking about is if if Georgia Kappelman did this kind of stuff, this kind of laughing, pen in the mouth, bringing out three ring binders and going through papers, you know there would be a, a motion on it for, <laughs> right, to call a mistrial immediately. Oh, the jurors couldn't concentrate because Georgia Kappelman. You know, we'd hear about that. And we'd hear about it in, in Charlie's phone calls, too. Donna would be up in arms, too. I know, Charlie. They weren't listening. They were looking at Georgia Kappelman. And her notebook, a three-wing binder was out. Un. Freaking real. Um, a wood, thank you, Wood Al. Calling out the obvious co oh, collectivity of the hive mind. Yeah, true. Good point, Wood Al. Always with the sharp comments. Thank you. And thank you very much for your super sticker. I appreciate it. Queen Tracy, I'm going to put on my, I took off my glasses and this is what I get. I got it. Um, thanks for making me laugh with a Donna voice. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's just, I just get so like, and thank you, Queen Tracy, for your, your super sticker or your super chat. I appreciate it. I just get so tired of all these ridiculous answers as to why or reasons why they lost the, the jury. They had, according to them, they had the premier jury consult. Now, you know, I mean, if you've been listening to my, you know what I think of Josh Dubin and the movement of which he comes from, not much. And I think they got scammed with that jury consultant. And I think what he did was really borderline, but good luck, you know, ever having any lawyer face any consequences for what they do. I thought it was really borderline. And he's like, if I'm giving you the wrong instructions, go check out um, on Murder by Maestro's channel. He has the whole, uh, or a lot of the voir dire on his channel. Watch Josh Dubin. I mean, he's making ridiculous ridiculous um i don't know if there are instructions or suggestions to the jury but that they keep the idea that charlie adelson is innocent all the way through 
till they uh, start talking about it in the jury room? How is that even possible? If everybody comes in, ignores, um, just doesn't evaluate the evidence as it comes to them in the trial. What are they supposed to be like thinking innocent, innocent, innocent all to there? And then they're going to have some other juror because there won't be any other juror to have any other position to discuss it with. It doesn't even make any sense. He's banking on that. In regards to Rivera's plea deal, the actual only condition of his plea deal is to tell the truth. And what did he tell us? Catherine Magbanoff hired Garcia and Garcia hired him to do a murder. Why? To help the lady who he understood to be the dentist's sister to get her kids. Aside from fitting with the other evidence in the case, there were a few things that independently corroborated Rivera's testimony. One is that accidental discharge that he told us took place in the rented Prius. This was a fact we didn't know before and were able to confirm upon reinspection of the vehicle. He also told us about the location and timing of the money drop on the morning after the murder at his and Jessica's residence, which was able to be confirmed or corroborated initially by phone records and now also by Catherine McDaniel's testimony. And of course, the phone records confirm Rivera did come to Tallahassee, not just on the July trip, which we knew about, but also on that June, first June scouting trip or attempted murder trip. The communication records tell us a few other things too. That's the June trip. July, June. This slide shows all the calls between our parties on the night before the shooters made that June trip to Tallahassee. You can see a 25 minute call from Catherine Magbanawa to the defendant at 9.17 p.m. on June 2nd, 2014. This call was placed while Catherine Magbanawa was consistent with traveling on her way back from comfort rental car where the first rental car was rented to her residence. As soon as the defendant hangs up with Katie, he calls his parents landline and has a 25 minute conversation. On the stand, the defendant was asked about the use of landlines and whether he believed them to be more secure. He testified that on the call he was being asked about at that time that he was talking about switching over to a landline because he was in a place that had bad reception. If there is bad reception in South Florida at a dental office, what about all the other mentions of using a landline that we hear on the wire? Surely he wasn't in a place with bad reception for all those calls. And why call the parents on the landline Surely they have reception in their South Beach high rise. In the two years of phone records that were examined in this case, the defendant talks to his parents on the landline 28 times or 0.07% of the times that he talks to them. So mostly on the cell phone by a large majority. Three of these 28 times were on the days that the cars were rented to do these trips to Tallahassee. Not That's just another coincidence, Georgia Kappelman. You're just dumbing down coincidences. That's what Charlie Adelson said. He just couldn't get reception all of those times. That just happened to do with the car and, and Dan Markell's murder. He always had to talk on a landline, but it was really just, it was real. could have been seen as that, but really it was about him just not getting good reception. Oh, the people of Tallahassee. It's funny when Charlie Adelson says like, oh, it's really a nice town. And then there's just Donna's like steely silence. Uh, that is a coincidence. It's entirely up to you. After the killer's return from Tallahassee on that first trip, we have a couple text messages of interest. On June 8th, 2014, the defendant indicates he's still working on dad's birthday present. And Donna indicates, I know you'll come through. Then on July 6th, 
We've got Wendy Adelson with a location at or near her parents' place. When she texts Dan Markell and confirms he's going to be in town for his own murder. This slide depicts the... Doesn't that just give you chills? That she had to confirm. There's Wendy confirming. Are you going to be in town from the 14th to the 18th? Because she has to plan a murder around it. There's something that would come up. Should Donna, ever, I mean, should Wendy, excuse me, I always do that. Should Wendy ever be tried? And then there's Donna's overly weird text message. Let me see if I can go back for a second and just look at it, what it is. Uh, there's, well, yeah, she says, I know it's a tough birthday being 70 and all, because we're definitely not talking about murder, but I'll know you come through. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that sound weird? If you didn't know anything, wouldn't you think that that was odd? I mean, an odd text message. And thank you very much, Jeffrey Jordan. Thank you. Great show, Roberta. He says, thank you. Yeah, it's just like, I can't even, like, it, that's so the way Donna covers up or does code stuff. It's like always too much, like a little talking too much. Like when she's asked on the bump call, do you remember? The Society page has a great video about this. When they're asked if Wendy's involved, and they're all like, uh, Donna's like, no, no, no. Like she says no, like emphatically a billion times. So we know that this is the way that this family um, covers up things, especially Donna. Always like protests a little too much. The night before the second trip. We know Catherine Magbanawa and the defendant are together that evening at her place. He departs between 12.42 and 1 a.m. And then at, so after the defendant departs Catherine Magbanawa's residence, we've got Catherine Magbanawa calling Sigrida Garcia. So within minutes of the defendant leaving, she calls Garcia. She talks to Garcia several more times into the wee hours of that night, the last one being at 1.56 a.m. And then at 9 a.m. the next morning, Garcia calls the rental car place. Once the Prius is rented, the second trip begins. The Prius is rented at 6.15 p.m. on July 15, 2014. There are several calls between our parties on the day that the Prius is rented. So we just talked about the night before the Prius was rented. On the day the Prius was rented, we've got these two calls, several calls, including these two calls from the defendant to his parents' landline. Garcia and Rivera then depart for Tallahassee July 16th, about 2 p.m., and arrive in Tallahassee around 1 a.m. Although this trip was only about 36 hours from the time they left Miami to the time they returned, there were 12 phone events between the defendant and Catherine Magbanoa during that time, and there were four phone events between the defendant and Donna Adelson during that time frame, including late into the night on the night before the murder. On July 17th, Magbanoa relayed to the shooters that this murder had to be done that day because the victim was scheduled to leave town the next day. And we confirmed that Dan Markell was in fact scheduled to leave for New York City the next morning on July 19th. It's hard to imagine how Louis Rivera could have obtained this information, if not in that pattern that we consistently observe in this case. Defendant to Magdanawa, to Garcia, to Rivera, and back the other way. Certainly you're not really to believe that the killers divine this information from the professor's blog. That's not reasonable. Wendy offered that Danny sometimes put his travel information on Facebook. 
So interesting comments. Someone was saying, so what I heard Luis Rivera say on the stand was the blog was Wendy. And people in the comments were saying the blonde was Wendy, but this was to the question, did you read it on a blog? So I'll have to take another listen, but I'm pretty sure he said the blog was Wendy. And uh, I'd like to make t-shirts of that. <laughs> <laughs> just the blog was Wendy. Yeah, I don't think he knows what a blog is, but it's so funny that Luis Rivera, who can't read, and Sigfredo Garcia were supposed to think that they got the information where Dan was from a blog. Come on, from his own blog. Come on. But you learned from Agent Sanford that there was no information about this particular trip on Danny's Facebook, so they didn't get it from there. This is because, as Rivera and McBanawa both told you, this information came in the form of that letter through, from the defendant through Captain McBanawa. How would these two hitmen even know where to go or who to kill if they hadn't been given any kind of instruction? Captain McBanawa said she knew the plan was to kill Wendy's ex, but she never knew his full name until after he was killed. She did, however, deliver that envelope to, that the defendant put in her diaper bag to Sigrid Garcia. The paper she knew contained the instructions for the murder. Defendant advised Catherine Ibano that she should not touch the envelope or open it as he had taken precaution to ensure that his prints and DNA would not be on it, that it would be untraceable to him, and she should do the same. She was to deliver the envelope to Garcia, and that's what she did. This is corroborated, corroborated by Rivera, who says Garcia had a paper with him on the first trip, and it contained a picture of Dan Markell and a printed address. On the day of the murder, we have communications between our parties as listed here with the red line representing the time of the murder. This flurry of calls between our persons of interest demonstrates the usual call pattern that we're seeing. Donna to the defendant, to Catherine Ibano, to Garcia and back. Um, we have Wendy getting a text message on the day of the murder about her TV repair appointment from her mother, Donna Adelson. So, so listen to this. So here, Wendy, as we know, is an unindicted co-conspirator in this case. But look at how much Wendy is a part of this closing argument. And listen to what George says about this text message. It's really sarcastic and funny and echoes a little bit of what I just said about Donna. Always overdoes it. So Donna's text message is... Um, to Wendy, Best Buy just called me, but I told them to confirm with you they are on their way over now to help you with the TV sets in your living room. So, I mean, doesn't that sound so unnatural? When have you got, when is the last time you got a text message like that? It indicates that Best Buy is on their way over to help you with the TV sets in your living room. Maybe she... Didn't remember which TV was broken. At 8.20, on the day of the murder, Wendy texts the defendant, this is so sweet. That text was deleted. What does it mean? At 9.19 a.m., there's a phone call between Wendy Adelson and this defendant that lasts about, what, 30 minutes? No. 18 minutes. So this is about 30 minutes before the murder when they hang up. They say they were discussing this TV that was not repairable. The TV that he gave her as a divorce present because it's cheaper than hiring a hitman. Only you guys can assess if you think that might just be a coincidence and nothing, nothing more. They didn't listen. Uh, the jury is not listening. Just clearly an 18-minute call is just a coincidence, guys. 18 minutes. So what are the chances that that call is like they're in town? 
I talked to Katie. This is Charlie. This is between Charlie and Wendy. This is an 18 minute and 17 second call. We're to believe it's the, the guys tell me the TV's unfixable. What, what's the call? What is there more to discuss? Oh, I'm telling you it's fixable. I'm telling you to keep that TV and they're going back and forth for 18 minutes about it. That's, I mean, you know, Charlie thought of everything. He looked at all the evidence and even he just came back to, oh, we were talking about the TV, right? I don't know if he even addressed it, as I recall. I don't even know if the defense addressed it. They're just like, oh, well, the jury will think it's about the TV. Maybe just another one of the million of coincidences in this case. This is what I'm talking about, circumstantial evidence. It's so hard to disprove. It all fits together so nicely. The Prius is at premiere at 9.16 a.m. The last phone communication between Garcia and Rivera is at 9.16. Afterwards, the phones turn off, consistent with what Rivera told you. We turned our phones off because we knew we were about to commit the murder. And they don't pop back up until, I think, about 12.30. The bus video catches them turning onto Benton Road to do the murder at 10.51 a.m., whereby they pull up right behind Professor Markell in his driveway. Sigfredo Garcia gets out of the Prius, approaches the driver's window, pointed his gun, and fired. Dan Markell raised his arm to protect himself, but it was no use. Professor Markell was executed at close range, whereby Garcia got back in the Prius and Rivera <coughs> drove them away. Markell was left there to suffer and die. If not for James Geiger, there's no telling how many hours he might have suffered there alone and unaided. He fought for his life for 14 long hours before he finally succumbed to his injuries. The autopsy confirmed that he was shot twice at close range with a 38 caliber revolver, consistent with what Rivera said they brought as the murder weapon. Next, he was stripped, x-rayed, photographed, and dissected because he had become a piece of evidence. When Garcia and Rivera get back on the road, they're on a second bus video, leaving town at 10.55. That narrows the time of this shooting down to a four minute window between 10.51 when they're seen turning on to Benton and 10.55 when they're caught fleeing the scene. And then we've got the 911 call from Mr. Geiger at 11.01 a.m. The first phone call that either Garcia or Rivera make after turning their phones, turning off their phones to do the murder. So first call after that is at 12.30 and it's Garcia to Catherine McDonald. Magbanawa assures them that they'll get their money the next day. This is the same time frame, roughly, that Wendy Adelson was visiting the crime scene. Wendy indicated that she went to turn on a Trescott from Centerville Road, observed a roadblock, and then turned around. But we learned that what she said happened could not have happened. Instead, the roadblock was all the way down here by the blue dot, the blue, oh, I've got two blue dots. The one at the top, top left of the, of the page there is where the roadblock was, that yellow line, three to, three to five houses <laughs> down from the scene. Trescott and Centerville is all the way down where the other yellow bar is. Visible from the roadblock that she approached and was observed doing so by Officer Brannon were multiple law enforcement vehicles, marked vehicles. There was crime scene tape up. There was a marked vehicle with an officer stationed at, at the perimeter. It was visible from that position that there was something going on at her kid's house, the house where they lived. 
Come on, Georgia. Did you not just hear Wendy say that she thought a tree was down and trees fall down all the time during that, during the summer, even though there was no storm that would have brought it down? Clearly they were doing CPR on the tree and you, and you're just dumbing down another coincidence. Sure, it was normal for her not to get out of the car, not to ask what was going on to make a three-point turn immediately and drive away. As Almost like someone who was checking out to make sure the job was done. Almost like that. But it wasn't that at all. You'd have to be stupid and or from Tallahassee to believe that. With their father. And what did Wendy Adelson do upon encountering this roadblock and observing that the police were, were present on the street where her kids lived? She turned around and proceeded to the liquor store to pick up her bullet bourbon. And the defendant says, well, this is another coincidence because she was asked to bring it to a party. Well, maybe. But the timing of the purchase and the fact that she went out of her way to go by the crime scene on her way to get the bullet bourbon should raise an eyebrow. But it's what she didn't do that's even more suspicious. She didn't ask Officer Brandon, hey, what's going on? She didn't call Danny. She didn't call the police to make any inquiries or even the daycare to make sure her kids made it there that morning. Remember, Danny had her kids. She didn't even call the daycare. Meanwhile, our shooters are headed back to Miami. They pop up on an ATM camera at 6.45 p.m. in Pembroke Pines, Florida. And then both of their phones are consistent with being at Rivera's residence as of about 7 p.m. that night. At 8.23 p.m., Catherine Ibanawa and the defendant make plans to meet up at his house. At 9 p.m., Donna texts the defendant. So more tomfoolery from rash bombs, whispering, laughing behind Georgia. It's really getting to me. I, just a question for you guys. Do you think that Rashi, because we know he was in touch all the time with, with Donna. Do you think he Donna was talking him up? Oh, you're doing a great job, Rashi. It's going so well. Everybody's telling me it's going so well. Do you think that's where he got his his confidence from? So what I'm asking is, do you think he kind of became part of this family hive mind of like, no one's going to beat the Adelson family? Nobody can beat us? Even after, I mean, Katie can go down. Sigfredo can go down, but not Charlie because he's an Adelson. And that seemed to be the strategy from the start. They were perfectly happy to sacrifice all those people. So revolting. I mean, that's one of the more disgusting things about this case is the dis of rich people using poor people to, to do their bidding. Outside your house, to which he responds, 10 men. He told you from the witness stand that this text meant that Donna was just passing by his house on her way to Tallahassee and that they weren't meeting up. But Catherine Magdalena testified that when she arrived at defendant's house, the defendant advised her that his parents had just been there and then he thought his mom had physically washed the money which was damp when Catherine Magdalena received it. Magdalena finds the defendant to be carrying his gun around and in a frantic state. Isn't that what money laundering is? I was laundering the money. What? Okay, it became a little moldy. I didn't know. Nobody told me. Nobody told me money gets moldy. I just wanted it extra clean because... We're a crime family and we do some money laundering on the side on the side. Such a hilarious part of this of this case, isn't it? About the time that these two are meeting up at the defendant's house to do the money exchange, Dan Markell is pronounced dead at TMH. 
So he says he's going to be about 10 minutes out. Here he is hitting at home at 9.40 p.m. At 9.46, we see Catherine Magdawa consistent with being at Rivera's residence and then consistent with heading toward the defendant's residence. She turns her phone off and it stays off for 11 hours. When Magdawa's phone pops back up, it's 9.44 a.m. on Saturday morning and she's headed back from the defendant's house or the direction of his house toward Rivera's residence. That's the money drop location. These phones are consistent with a meeting at 1030 at Rivera's, which is the time, date, and place that he advised us he received his money from Magdalena. At 1213 p.m., the defendant reaches out to Magbanawa. Defendant, headed to the gym. Are you taking the kids to the beach? It's so nice. Magbanawa, it's beautiful. Probably the pool. Defendant, nice, have fun. Ethan must be happy. This is what he's texting Magbanawa within hours of her leaving with all the money in his safe. All of the money that he stared at and loved. Georgia, are you not considering what Charlie said on the stand, who was very likable and not at all arrogant and unlikable, according to Donna? Are, are you not considering that Katie told them to never mention the extortion and Charlie, who has such a good track record of keeping his mouth shut, just wanted to talk about the pool and all that? They They weren't going to the pool. They weren't going anywhere. He was just sitting and mourning his missing money. None of that was going on. Do you guys remember that part of his cross-examination? I thought it was super effective. So things that you wouldn't even think of as being all that damning, these sort of harmless, everyday text messages were super damning in this case. Because according to Charlie, all this, you know, he had just emptied his safe and given it to super scary and threatening Katie, four foot 11 McBanawa. That's so absurd. It's such a crazy, absurd defense, but not any dumber than any of the other innocence campaigns that are, are run every day that people argue with me every day. And what they'll say is everybody reacts differently, but they really don't. There's a spectrum of normal human behavior. And this goes way out of those bounds of how people react to situations. Same with Wendy. There is a, there is a, a spectrum of, of human behavior of coming up. And I would say it's pretty close. Some people would get out. Some people would cry and try to, you know, cross the, I'm talking about Wendy go, driving by the crime scene. Most people would get out. Almost everybody would get out or ask what's going on. And if they didn't get out, they would be calling, wondering what's going on. But Wendy did none of those things. I loved on since he was a child. And he wants to know if she's going to the pool. <clears throat> This might be a good time to remind you that the jury room is not a place to check your common sense. We want you to bring it in there. You have heard two wildly different versions of how this thing went down. And they can't both be right. I mean, somebody's trying to sell you a bill of goods. You were selected with the belief that you would be able to cut through the garbage and make sense of the evidence in this case and render a verdict that speaks the truth. A major problem for the defense theory is the idea that the defendant and McDonough broke up after the murder, but then grew closer together over the next two years as she was collecting his monthly extortion payments. This is one of the more unreasonable parts of the defendant's testimony, or well, it's definitely in the top four along with Latin King extortion payment plans, hit men that hire themselves to kill someone that their intended future extortion victim hates, 
And most of re unreasonable of all is probably that Charlie Adelson, the guy that talks so tough in the hot tub about his, his unsavory connections, an arrogant man of extraordinary resources, a prize fighter of verbosity, would just lay down and take this in silence. Let's review some of these love checks. Um, we've got that one. Then we've got July 22nd. They're talking about the weather. They're talking about prescription shampoo. On October 6th, the defendant says, I love you. It makes me feel good that you care about me. I'm very lucky to have you as a part of my life. What? Lucky? Lucky. He says, I love you again on 224.15. According to him, he's now been making payments for seven months. He's had her on the payroll for six months. No Latin kings have come. Who doesn't love their extors extortionist? And I'm just curious what you think is the most ridiculous part. So I've been saying the, that Charlie's defense was that the killers did it on spec, but it's a better, a better description is that they hired themselves and just did it on their own idea. It was their own idea to kill Dan Markell. So when Charlie Adelson and the whole Adelson family hated and wanted desperately to get off planet Earth, just by coincidence, they chose that person. Not someone closer to him, not someone more scary. Or do you think it is, I mean, I just think this is one of the more ridiculous parts is that we agreed to talk about, it, not talk about it. And I was just trying to make everything seem like it was going normal. And that we got closer after the extortion. You remember that testimony? Oh, I don't know. They're all so ridiculous. It's hard to pick one, but I'm curious what you guys would say. Contacted him in any way about collecting his outstanding debt of $195,000. Yet he continues to pay and love on Catherine McBanala without reservation and without the slightest suspicion that she might be in on this and without the slightest concern for helping solve the murder of who killed his brother-in-law. Defendant says he believed Catherine Nardamo wasn't taking any of the money even after he put her on the payroll. The checks are going to her because she seemed broke. Defendant's explanation for all the love texts with Catherine McBano is that he felt sorry for her. He felt she was in the same position that he was in, being manipulated in the same way that he was. But the fact remains, folks, that she's taking his money. She's connected to the guy that's extorting him. She's connected to the guy that killed his brother-in-law. It defies logic that he would then proceed to grow closer with her. But he has to say that because he can't no other way around these texts. It also defies reason based on what we know of this man, that he would take her for her word and just empty his safe into her purse and then keep paying, presumably forever, without asking any questions, talking about it all, or reporting anything to the police. Magdama began getting checks from Adelson Institute two months after Markel's murder, and she continued receiving checks from that time frame up until the bump. That the checks stopped happening at the time of the bump. And you should be asking yourself what that means. Why did the checks stop happening? Well, you would reasonably figure they stopped happening because the parties got spooked because law enforcement, they suspected the bump could be law enforcement. Law enforcement might be getting closer, take her off the payroll. If defendant was being extorted as he told you on the witness stand, why would, why would the payment stop? Why would the extortionist care if other extortionists had jumped on the bandwagon? Why would the bump impact the defendant's existing obligations to the original Latin kings? 
The defendant said he put her on the payroll at Adelson Institute at her request to help her get insurance for her kids with the understanding that the money was being funneled through her to someone else and she wasn't actually getting any of the proceeds. She was just going to use that paycheck to assist her with getting subsidized housing or insurance, I think it was, for her kids. But you can see from this slide, which is dated June 24th, 2014, that she's texting him about getting on the payroll prior to this alleged first extortion effort. He says no problem at that time. This is between the first and second trips. <coughs> She's asking to be on the payroll. So the explanation from the defendant about why she's on the payroll does not fit with the other evidence in this case. So we've got all this evidence that points to the defendant. The motive points to him. When we follow the money, it leads to him. The Prius eventually leads back to him through these conspirators. And each time we have a big event in this case, we see these call flurries where all the parties are calling each other in that structure that I've talked about. It goes from this one to this one to this one. But as the defense points out, these folks had independent relationships with each other that could explain those communication patterns. So without knowing the content, how could we know if they're really talking about the murder or if these call flurries around these key events are just a coincidence? A conspiracy can be shaped like a cluster with everybody talking to everybody. It can be shaped like a wheel with one central hub talking to all the different spokes. Or it can be shaped like a train car, which is what we have here, where one person talks to only the person, the car in front of them and the car behind them. Law enforcement was asking these same questions. How is this conspiracy shaped? How does it work? How does information flow through it? What are different parties relative roles within a conspiracy. And the wiretap and bump were designed to answer those questions. Did you notice that Donna Adelson, see how the paper's folded in half? She didn't even look at the paper before she put it in her purse. She didn't think this was a process server. She knew exactly what it was the moment this man approached. And then she just goes about her business. Does she uh, excuse me, Georgia. Did you not hear the call? Georgia, that's exactly right. Did you not hear my call? I said, I said, go to law enforcement. If you, they, they can pay you a lot more money than $5,000. That's what I said. I said, go to law enforcement. I said, I knew nothing about it. <laughs> sure, sure. I had my lawyer call up and say, none of us are talking. Sure. Not anyone in our family, according to June, had any interest in who murdered Dan Markell, including Wendy. So the, the father of her children, no interest. It's just one of those things that happens. Yeah, I hear that happens a lot in Tallahassee. Just random, random things like that happen. Sure was a, it was just a, I mean, how could the Tallahassee juries not see that? It was just a lucky coincidence for the Adelson family yet again. Oh, Donna's trial is going to be so good. Please don't plead out, Donna. Please don't. I don't think she will. She's too arrogant to, to take a plea. And I don't think any plea deal would be offered either. I think I've kind of got a lot of comments about Sigfredo Garcia. No one's giving him a plea deal. What would be the point? I mean, he's the shooter. And try telling the Markel family, oh, we're giving a plea deal to Sigfredo to get Wendy. I think, I don't know. I hope there's enough evidence. I don't know what the other things Georgia has alluded to, that she has more evidence that we haven't seen. And more evidence against Don. We have to assume some of that is against Donna too. Oh, so I, you know, Donna says she wants to rush this trial along. And I hope she, I hope, I hope it happens. Thank you so much. Kyle Wagner uh, says, great show, Roberta. Comments are on fire. Okay, thank you. Comments um, 
also got a really good comment about June's testimony, how important it was. And they were absolutely right that, you know, it's easy to get so distracted in what was going on between Charlie and June on the stand, but she does say a whole lot of da damaging things, even if she has to hem and haw to say them. Whoever made that comment is right on for the right on. It's just what imp what um, impressed me so much was how much he manipulated her from the from the defense table, meaning Charlie. Okay, back to Georgia's amazing closing arguments. Law enforcement, this valuable information that could be used to solve the brutal murder of her son-in-law. I mean, this guy that approached her obviously knows something about who killed Dan Markell, right? So surely she went straight to the cops. Nope. Instead, she goes straight to this defendant, who goes straight to Catherine Mendoza, who goes straight to Superio Garcia. In that first call after the bump, Donna says she doesn't want to talk on the phone. But defendant can't leave it alone. He asked, does it involve me or other people? Her answer, well, probably the both of us. Probably both of us. Did you not know I have an imaginary friend, Georgia? Did you not know that I have an imaginary friend? Me and me. I clearly... <laughs> I don't know. What is she going to say? What is she going to say to that? And I wasn't talking about this. I got another hand delivered thing just that day, just that day, same day. I mean, try defending this. Try being, being Donna's lawyer. Dan Rashbaum is so un, unprepared for this. I mean, you would need, I mean, he obviously is a lawyer ready to say anything and thank you so much jbz what's donna's backstory gma lorraine too i don't know what that means but donna's backstory i know it's hard to know there's so little of it out there I know that she's from New York, obviously. It gotta be from Long Island, that area. Or it sounds like she is, to my ear. And she was a homemaker and worked with her husband, Harvey, right? In his dental clinic. I love that they call it an institute. But yeah, it's hard to know how Donna got I mean, when Harvey and Donna must have met, that must have been true love. Like they met, they met someone who loves revenge and has all the same values. Or do you think she molded Harvey over the years? I don't know. I, I think that they probably were both like when two antisocial personalities meet, it's on very quickly. That's, that's what I've observed. Okay. You guys getting bored? I mean, I'm happy to, you know, watch the end of this, but let me know if you're getting bored and we can save it for another day. He says, what's that? Probably the two of us. So you probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. He doesn't say, no, I have no general idea what you're talking about. He says, <laughs> all right. He absolutely does have a general idea what she's talking about. And if they were innocent, as the defendant has claimed, and this was, in fact, a second extortion attempt, there is not a reason in the world why they wouldn't just say that. I got approached by another one. One came and paid me a visit today. It's happening again. In call B, the defendant asked Donna to take a picture of the bump letter and send it to him, and she refuses. Why? Are the Latin kings going to see the text? Mm -hmm. 
Do you think someone is trying to blackmail you? Maybe, uh-huh, could be, I don't know. No, that's crazy. That's his response, and I'm not adding the emphasis on that syllable. He says it like that. That's crazy. How is it crazy? You're already being extorted by Latin King number. Do you remember, doctor? Because he hadn't come up with that part yet. In call C, defendant calls back again to tell Donna not to talk about things in the apartment or any place. Why? Why? The Latin Kings aren't in there. And she doesn't ask why, because it's obvious. She says, oh, obviously. Why? Because they might be under surveillance? Well, who cares if they have nothing to hide? Here we see the first use of code on the wire. People don't talk in code if they've done nothing wrong. People do not talk in code if they haven't done anything wrong. Defendant knows, I mean, he knows that fact, and that's why he told you we didn't talk in code on the wire. We spoke carefully. Oh my, did you just see Charlie, that watch? Charlie just knows his goose is cooked. He's writing a note to Dan Rashbaum. Just check out what's going on behind, behind Georgia right here. Hold on. Watch this. As she's making the point that Charlie Adelson would have been used to extortion, wouldn't have been surprised by Donna. And thank you for whoever said Donna's from Brooklyn, not Long Island. She sounds so much like she's from Long Island, but of course, very close. Uh, what, uh, look at him. He, he looks like almost sick to his stomach. Wait, is, did I go back far enough? Hold on. Okay. Right here. So they're both turning their heads. They, he's almost looks like Charlie almost looks like he's mimicking Rashi here, the way he's writing. They're both writing at the same time. And then he's, he hands this note to Rashbaum and he shakes his head and he just gives a look like it's over. The same kind of look that we saw at the when he, when the sentencing, um, not the sentencing, the verdict came. Excuse me. He knows. I mean, he knows that fact, and that's why I told you we didn't talk in code. We spoke carefully. Did you see that? That subtle shake shake of the head. It's so similar to to the verdict. That look. That very pale. And his face is, I don't remember a uh, defendant this expressive. Ever watching a trial with defendant this expressive? Usually they're stony, steely and stony. Certainly Maxwell was like that. Larry Ray, I couldn't see. I was behind him. Um, Keith Ranieri was just writing post-it notes the whole time. But Charlie Adelson, you can tell what he's thinking pretty much from his face. And he loses color in it. Looks like he's going to throw up here or vomit. And they both have that habit. Did you notice Wendy and Charlie when they're in cross-examination? So that they'll change words. So, for example... Georgia will ask him if he had a gun or if a gun was held to his head. And he goes, no, a firearm was not held to my head. And when Wendy, did you, uh, did you throw up on the table? Yes. I vomited on the table. Like there's a difference between firearm and gun. Like it's just an odd way of gaining control. I thought, but there may be another reason for it. It's very odd. What does that mean? Careful of what? Defendant also told you under oath that he regrets that his mom randomly used the word TV in this call as part of her careful talk. The defendant got Wendy Adelson a TV as a divorce present as a cheaper alternative to hiring a hitman. Dan Markell was killed by a hitman. Then the same TV is Wendy's alibi for the murder, 
a service appointment that her mother set up for her from South Florida. And then on the wire, Donna says, quote, this TV is going to cost about five. Does the defendant say, what TV? <coughs> what are you talking about since you inserted a random object into this careful talk conversation? No, he doesn't need to ask what TV because he knows exactly what she's talking about and he parrots it back. They asked you for $5,000. The defendant has advised you that this TV stuff is a coincidence. Is it a coincidence or is it obvious they're referring to their conspiracy and this murder? Only you can decide which explanation is credible. The players in this case are smart. They've given a lot of thought to their preparations before this and to their explanations after. We know the seed was planted in early 2013 and it took over one year to come to fruition. And they really thought of almost everything. A clever TV related alibi for Wendy, a frame job for Lacasse, and they insulated themselves by hiring Catherine McDanawa as a middleman, walling themselves off like those train cars, only communicating with the one in front and the one behind, and having no connection to the one further down the line. It's also important to note that in these first few calls, A, B, and C, that Donna Adelson describes the bump to the defendant and she says the person that approached her mentioned an ex-girlfriend, but she does not say the name Katie or Catherine. Then with only this very limited information, defendant calls only one of his many ex-girlfriends, Catherine McBanawa. In call D, defendant tells McBanawa that he thinks that this undercover, the would-be extortionist, said her name. We know this is true. The, the undercover did say Katie, but Donna had not yet told the defendant that. They only communicated in, call, communicated in calls A, B, and C. And the only communication on those calls was that, that the person mentioned ex-girlfriend. On the wire, the defendant says he just called Katie, Catherine McBanawa, because she was his most recent ex-girlfriend. Well, we know that's not true because there's at least one woman that defendant will admit meets that definition between McBanawa and the bump, and that's Whitney Kick. Now Georgia's just really cooking. Look at Charlie's face. She is cooking with gas. I mean, now you really understand why it only took the jury th less than three hours to come to a verdict. There is, I mean, it just wipes out any kind of other explanation for this. And if you wanted to believe Charlie, that's all he had was his story. Say even his lawyer was right and his testimony was a 95 and he was great on the stand, which I don't, I didn't feel he was all that great. He was very aggressive. If you're going to, if, if you're going to quote me, date me, thank you to ever just reminded me of that obnoxious moment in the comments. And then I always think back to when he pulled up by memory the evidence because it just reminded me that he's tailored this whole story to the evidence. He's tried to approach this the way that you approach like a test taking or, um, well, if I know all the right answers, but it's not uh, so much about right answers as... <laughs> to try to like tailor your story and have a reason for everything. It, it just doesn't make sense in the larger. It's just not logical or rational. Even if you say that's the truth and that's what happened. Sorry. Sorry. No, not in a million years. If you've lived on planet earth, are you going to say that this is something that could, might've, was was an equally 
plausible theory to what the state put up, right? And thank you so much. Is there a uh, cat, Joselle? Is there any video of the interview of the Geek Squad guy? Not that I'm aware of, not that I've seen, but that's a good question. Chad, do you know? Have you have you seen that video? Excuse me, hold on. All right, back to it. And thank you to whoever is still watching. I know this is very long. But um I appreciate you you sticking with it. I think we're about about three quarters of the way through it. On the stand, he told you all that the the all the you might you might not be the right Katie conversation. There's several mentions of that yo, I'm not sure you're the right Katie. I apologize. I'll feel stupid if you're not the right Katie. That was designed to reassure her that he was not setting her up. Once defendant meets with his mother and gets the details and the paper with the undercover's phone number, he meets up with Catherine Magdalena at Dolce Vita. If they had any evidence, we'd have already gone to the airport. Does that sound like an innocent man? Even if they bug your phone, you're still not talking about any of this. Talking about what? The cops would only bug your phone to get information about the murder. And if you don't have any, then there's nothing to not talk about. The cops aren't going to be doing a wiretap to investigate him getting extorted, which he hasn't even reported to law enforcement. So, not talk about what. Defendant discusses how he's going. See how they talk? Like, he's telling her not to talk. Such a clever way to say, well, you know, you have nothing to worry about because you're not talking, right? Right? You're not going to be talking on the phone because they might be bugging you. It's a warning, but it's just the way the Adelson family talks. It's always under the surface, the real meaning. And you it's you gotta decode it. It's not not hard to decode either. I mean, Charlie is really the of all the Adelsons, I I consider him the the dumbest. I mean, even in the quote that I had to pull, I mean, he's complaining about this trial in Georgia so much. And I couldn't even, I had to put dot, 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 because he says, like every minute, his vocabulary is like five words. And he can't even string a full coherent sentence together. Okay. And to start arming himself and is prepared to shoot. He told you under oath from the stand that he was being threatened and extorted by gang members for two years at the time that this recording was made. And now he's just starting to think about carrying a gun? Does this sound like a man that's been living in fear for two years? Does this sound like a guy who lays down and takes his lumps without question when threatened? Someone comes up to me asking for money in my house? He says that, lines 23 and 24 on the top there. He says this as if it's a preposterous proposition that somebody would just walk into his house and demand money. But isn't that what happened to you? How is that preposterous? But wait, what changed? On the next page, he says, yeah. And when the, guess what? 
when the fucking police show up and there's a doctor, there's an oral surgeon standing there with a dead gang member in his fucking driveway, they're not going to come down too hard on me. This is the same man who took the witness stand and swore under oath that he was a victim in this case and that he had been too paralyzed by fear of gang members to come forward and report his victimization. Dr. Adelson on this recording is the real Dr. Adelson. On the stand, he was so controlled, so knowledgeable about his case, so practiced. But there is no way to explain away his statements on this recording. When the bump happens. And I think that's what they thought of Katie and Sigfredo. If any of them, who's going to care about them being in prison? To the Adelson family, that's important. Who cares about a dead gang member? Who are they going to believe? These guys or the Adelson family with the political connections? And it worked for a little while. And so grateful to Georgia Kappelman and everyone who fought to continue to prosecute this case beyond Luis Rivera and Katie and Sigfredo Garcia. But that really does betray him. And did you see, did you hear her say, excuse me, Charlie Adelson's testimony was so practiced, so practiced. That's exactly what it was. Rehearsed, practiced, and Rashbaum, he can't argue because he knows, I, I bet you anything that he was playing Georgia Kappelman's role to Charlie and giving him tough crosses as, as practice exams. But this is, you can think you won a battle, but he won no battles. He scored no points. His story made no sense. He was incredibly unlikable. So that if you were going to even, if you were even tempted to kind of, yeah, it's not uh, where the likability comes in is if you believe that he he's lying or not. So when he says, I'm telling you the truth, that's when the likability is really key. Is this someone I would trust with anything? This is someone who has a character that uh, is of good character that tells the truth. No, no, and no, and no. So Donna's not going to do, oh, Donna. I mean, she's going to, I think she's going to play up her age, uh, play up her health. But I don't think it's going to work. Maybe on sentencing, maybe, but I don't think so. I don't think so with this judge. You get to observe this defendant in action in his role as fixer or problem solver. He's working those phones, trying to get Katie to investigate the bump and find out if it's legitimate or not. And also trying to reassure Donna that it's just the cops fishing and it's nothing to worry about. The bump is an actual recorded example of how this defendant acts when he is threatened by a purported extortionist. And how he acts is the complete opposite of how he's telling y'all he acted in the first extortion. Number one, he does not stay quiet about the bump. He talks about it a lot. There are multiple calls with Donna and Katie discussing the bump and what the next step should be. Two, he takes action. There are multiple in-person meetings with his mom and with Katie and eventually with his dad, too, about the bump and what to do about it. Three, he investigates the bump. He asks questions. He enlists Magbanoa to find out who this is. He talks a lot about his concerns that this will not be just a one-time payment but could turn into some ongoing problem. 
And four, he doesn't take it lying down. He threatens Nazi shit if these people think they can threaten his family and get away with it. He suggests that the problem might require an additional murder. Quote, if he can't do it, I'll find someone else that can. Number yeah, and I'd love to know who that someone else was. But do you think Donna could possibly say her defense could be, oh, Charlie did this on his own? But then she has that recording, the two of us, right? So oh, how do you structure a defense? I think her defense is going to be, I'm a, I think it's going to be very much like Charlie's. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a esteemed periodontist and not at all involved in these matters. I was the victim. Right. And Donna's going to be like, um, let me see. Donna would be like, look, I mean, I'm just your average grandmother. I love to play with my children. When I'm not with my grandchildren, I'm 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 baking banana bread. I'm definitely not plotting anything so crazy as murder with my family. Murder, murder. They're accusing me, me Donna Adelson of murder. I think she's going to go totally the age. I'm too old. I have too much to lose. The same thing. They tried to argue that Charlie Adelson was too busy, too busy to be involved in a murder conspiracy with a straight face in this trial. That was one of the things. Remember Wendy talking about how busy or she started that, I believe at the police station, how busy he was. So it sounds like something Donna thought of. He's a busy periodontist. He doesn't have time for, for murder. They're not going to suspect us. Murder, murder. <laughs> but, it would be like, uh, be like an honest, uh, an honest ad for Donna's banana bread. Hi, I'm Donna Adelson. When I'm not baking banana bread for my most hated son-in-law, I like to plan some murder with, <laughs> with my family. A, a good murder plot. What family brings the whole family together? For five, he's suspicious. He does not blindly accept the representations of this purported blackmailer that approached his mother. It's clear from the Dolce meeting that he doesn't fully trust Katie. He certainly doesn't trust this purported blackmailer that bumped into his mom. The person that represented themselves, the person that, that approached his mom represented himself as a Latin King gang member, right? I'm a brother of this guy that I met in Broward or whatever. And he's demanding money from her. Yet, the defendant does not take his word for it that he's a gang member. He's not so in fear for his mother's life that he opens the safe and gets five grand more out and gives it to Katie. A pittance compared to the amount he's telling you he handed out to the first layer of extortion. Number six, he doesn't pay. He doesn't bring the five grand to Dolce and give it to Katie and say, go pay it. Because that's what I do when I'm threatened to pay. Mm -hmm. He doesn't pay, he doesn't ever pay. And it's only five grand. Instead, he analyzes and thinks through and talks about every possible scenario. Defendant says it's one of two things or one or two scenarios, one being the cops, two being someone actually trying to blackmail his family about this murder. According to him now, he's been blackmailed for two years and he's talking to Catherine Ibano, he's talking to the person that's been collecting his money all those months, but at no point does he acknowledge the first extortion in the Dolce Vita meeting, why not? Oh, because she asked me not to talk about it. Well, times have changed. There's a second extortion effort now, and they're approaching my mother. You think I'm not gonna mention the first extortion? Your people have been running their mouths, and now they've tracked down my mother. You need to go get this under control. Nothing like that.
Next in the Dolce recording, defendant begins to explain how to prove a crime, the police have to put the person at the scene, not just in the car. He's reassuring her that even if we, law enforcement, can tie her or the shooters to the Prius, that we'll never be able to charge them. Because they didn't come to Tallahassee, they didn't shoot anyone, they didn't do anything wrong, and therefore they can't be held accountable. But that is not the law as the judge has instructed you. Everyone who wanted this done and did some act toward accomplishing it is guilty as the one that pulled the trigger. He's also telling her that even if Rivera has run his mouth to this would-be extortionist, his word alone that, hey, if he goes to the cops and says, starts singing and says, hey, Rivera told me he did this murder, that's not going to be enough. Basically, I can't use the word hearsay, but that's not going to be enough to proceed on an arrest in this case. This person knows information, so Katie, they'll be back. Whoever it is knows information. Information about what? You had nothing to do with it. Remember that, doctor? You, you've been extorted and that hasn't been reported. What information do they have? You mean information that could be used to solve the murder of your former brother-in-law? Oh my gosh, did you guys just see that? He's doing a Donna. He's doing a Donna. Char Charlie, right behind Georgia, starting mouthing stuff in court. It's get to mouthy. Watch this. Okay, that's. I hope I went back far enough. You have nothing to do with it. Remember that, doctor? You, you've been extorted, and that hasn't been reported. What information do they have? Does anyone read lips? <laughs> what is he doing back there? I've never seen a witness like this in a murder case ever, in any case, except Donna, except Donna. And she's not even, she hasn't even been um, just from that one hearing. Remember, she's doing all that stuff. Oh my gosh. Dr. Zap, Dr. Zap hasn't seen me once, not once, not once has he seen me, right? When her lawyer was asking how many times she was asking, um, wasn't the warden, but it was like the jail warden guy in charge of the jail. Excuse me for not remembering his name. How many times the mental health professional, Dr. Zap, I'm just, it's really Dr. Sap, but I just love, I love the Dr. Zap thing. Seen Donna, she's like, not once, not once. And here, Charlie's doing the same stuff. You mean information that could be used to solve the murder of your former brother-in-law? If so, why wouldn't you want those people to go to the cops? Why wouldn't you want them to come forward with that information? Then the guilty parties will be held accountable. Your extortionists will be jailed without you having to do or risk anything. Next, defendant talks about what will happen if the would-be extortionist undercover is picked up by law enforcement. Next thing you know, this person is singing. Other people start singing. As soon as they have him, he starts calling your name out, and then there's going to be police at your door and at my door. If you're innocent of this murder, why are you worried about the extortion? Clearly, they didn't take into consideration the Adelson family sing-along. That's what he's talking about. They all sing. We all sing very loudly. And then the police come and tell us to turn it down. What? They're making, uh, it's just another coincidence, right, Charlie? But I wish we had just his face, just a, uh, just a camera on his face. Because he starts out all cocky at the beginning of Georgia's closing arguments. And by the end, he just looks like, he, like he's like just so defeated diminished and defeated and 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 angry too very angry he's telling law enforcement whatever it is he knows about the murder of dan markell defendant says he wants to pay the money oh, got ahead of myself he wants to pay the money but he's explaining to her the problem with paying is that people might keep coming back or tell their friends who We'll get jump on board as well. 
he's explaining to her the problems with paying a potential extortionist. What he doesn't say, which is what you would expect if he'd been getting extorted for two years, is Garcia, or whoever you've been giving my money to, has obviously been running their mouths, and now they are messing with my mother. Next, he gives instructions. Say my friends have no idea what you're talking about. <coughs> And frankly, I don't know what you're talking about, but the name sounds familiar of who's incarcerated. So I'm gonna give you something as charity to help the less fortunate, but do not contact these people again or they're going to the police. The whole time you're talking, just say, I don't know what's going on. Only use the words help and charity. This isn't the guy described in this first extortion who just rolled over when threatened. He's in control. He's giving the orders. He's giving instructions. Why would you have to give instructions to a blackmailer about how to handle a blackmailer? Next, the defendant says, now he's fucking with his wife and he's fucking with him and you fuck with the king himself, you better kill him because he's gonna be a big problem. And he knows who you are you, if he can't do it, I'll have someone else do it. Defendant testified that this means the only way to stop Garcia is to kill him. He's not talking about killing him. He's just saying he's a really bad dude, and that's the only way to kill him. The evidence shows that he's... Look at Charlie in the back nodding his head along with that. Look at him nodding his head along with that. He's like, yeah, that's what, that's clearly the... The logical, logical, rational <laughs> answer to that. Uh, thank you. Faith in the unseen. George, the boyfriend, is secretly an undercover. <laughs> Love the channel. Thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, thank you to whoever's still listening. I understand that this is long. I just really think it should be kept in one piece. So I'm trying to, I don't think it would be as good breaking it up. And it's certainly not as, it's just so much fun to see Charlie just, just <laughs> lose his mind, lose his mind in the back of this. He's so humiliated. I mean, she just humiliated him. <laughs> That's what he looks like to me, just humiliated, defeated, angry. Maybe we should get Georgia some protection. Maybe he's, maybe he's trying to get a hit out on, on Georgia. Maybe that's what there's some secret codes. <laughs> for murder, for murder. He's saying if Garcia can't handle the undercover, He'll get somebody else to do it. Then he says, and so help me God, if they fuck with my family, it's going to be fucking Nazi shit because this will be done. I mean, Katie, I don't care what I spend, okay? I swear to God. Defendant and I went back and forth on the stand about what Nazi shit might include, and I think we ultimately agreed that that would be killing. And then he says, I don't care what I have to spend. If you're struggling to figure out who this man is, that's a good clue right there. He's going to buy a solution to this problem, exactly how he paid for a solution to the problem of Danny Markell. Here he wants to know if Garcia has any bad feelings toward him, meaning, is Garcia willing to look into this and handle this for me? Or does he still hate me because I used to date you? If defendant had really been getting extorted all along, surely he'd say something like, I've been paying all this money, I've been compliant with everything. Can you get him to look into this and figure this out? Katie, I'll go to the moon and back for you. Why? Because she did something big for him, and he's going to be indebted to her for the rest of his life. 
Not because he feels sorry for her, not because she's his protector. He is the protector. He'll go to the moon and back for her because they're neck deep in this conspiracy together. Somebody messes with her, they mess with him. Somebody messes with him, they're messing with her. It's the same thing. Here he's demonstrating an understanding of, a, a rational understanding of how blackmail works. His example is that you could blackmail someone that's cheating on their wife, meaning you blackmail someone that you have dirt on. You don't go kill somebody and then go up to an innocent person and say, I killed your brother-in-law, give me money. At the end of the conversation, the defendant says, you know who this is coming from? Inside. And then I don't have a slide for this, but he goes on to talk about what he will do for her. I don't have to sit here and tell you what I would do. I show you what I could do. You know what I'm saying? You know how I am. I look for things to do. You don't ask me for shit. Didn't she ask you for $138,000 and then a payment plan and then another $195,000? Just a mic drop moment for Georgia. Absolutely defeats, defeats any of that rationale. Because here he is, he's offering Katie cruises. Does, do you and your mom want to go on a cruise? You want this, you want that. But meanwhile, <laughs> I love that. Meanwhile, like the bump, they want $5,000. Like, wait, who's asking? But Katie, his extortionist, they got closer after she extorted him. The love blossomed. And he's saying, you don't even have to ask me. I give before it's even asked. And you know, with the Adelson family, their reputation for generosity does <laughs> receives them not. They don't do anything for anybody unless it benefits them in some way. You don't hear about the dental clinics they set up and blah, blah, blah for people who couldn't pay. Nothing. Nothing. Not even in his defense do you hear anything like that. Oh, he, anybody testify? Charlie was a very generous person. You don't ask me for shit. I look for things to do for you. Is that a statement that would be made to his blackmailer, or at least the woman that's taking the money to the blackmailers. These are just a selection of the incriminating quotes on this Dolce Vita recording, and I know it's a struggle to listen to it. You will have the recording, not the transcripts, but you'll have all the audios. The transcripts are just demonstratives. They don't go back, but you can kind of hunker down and listen as much as you can to get what you can out of that Dolce recording because it is full of gems and you can probably think of 10 more arguments than the ones I've just tortured you with today. In the initial recordings, the defendant and Magbanawa seem to be kind of dancing around the issue, right? Nobody ever speaks directly. He can't know for sure at this point that she's not involved in the extortion effort or possibly wearing a wire and she can't know for sure that he's not wearing a wire so they're both just feeling each other out in the first several interactions after the bump but those are the best stuff before they start to figure out okay we really think this is law enforcement after the meeting with magbanwa defendant calls donna and tells her he had coffee with a friend and gave her some good relationship advice now remember he's not talking code he assures Donna repeatedly that it's being handled and there's nothing to worry about. Then we hear in call H, the call where Magbanoa calls Garcia and he's really angry. And she needs him to call that number to figure out who this is and to deal with it. Ultimately, Garcia says he will take care of the problem. The less she knows, the better. And then he tells her to stop talking about it on the phone and hangs up. Then we go to this. Oh, that's that. 
And then we've got the, the, the real struggle over the phone number. The point of this is that this number was handed to Donna. The number goes from Donna to Charlie, to Katie, and now to Garcia. Here in call J, we hear the reference to investment as code for the $5,000 extortion payment. A good investment would be someone who really does know something, not somebody that's just fishing, and will agree that 5,000 is gonna handle it. You're gonna go away, you're gonna be silent about whatever you know, 5,000 is gonna do it. A bad investment would be someone who has just read the papers and decided, hey, I'm gonna try this, a, a law enforcement officer, or somebody that's gonna take 5,000 and just keep coming back for more and more and more and more and be a continuous problem. This is a composite slide of all the places in the recordings that are in evidence where the parties express concerns about the details, the details that the undercover had. It's getting too detailed. He's coming up with a lot of fucking details, et cetera. It's obvious they're analyzing the legitimacy of the undercover and assessing how much of a threat he is based on the quantity and the quality of the details that he has about the killing of Dan Markell. Then you've got more property and listing code talk. More concern that the blackmailer might try to increase the amount Here's a composite slide uh, illustrating all the different calls where the defendant expresses concern that if he pays, that might not be the end of it. And the reason why I think this is so important is because you've been paying for two years. Why are you analyzing how blackmail goes or might go so much? You're supposedly an expert in it. Here, defendant gets stern with Captain McDanawa, telling her to find out who the F it is and stop playing their games. Again, for a guy that's you know living in mortal fear of Latin King gang members, he's pretty confident. He's pretty in control. Recall that. And wouldn't he be a little bit in fear of Katie? But I guess he can't be too much in fear of Katie because he's supposed to be having this great love affair with her, with his extortionist, with the sorceress extortionist. And her I mean, and paying for half a boob job. So generous. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the details in this case, you just couldn't make up. So crazy. Look at, look at Charlie's face. He's sunk. The hometown girl is, I mean, so diminishing. That's how he describes Georgia Kappelman. Has demolished you, demolished you into this closing. In this, in this one call, she basically says, I can't, you know, she's really furious in this call. And she's like, I can't do all this code anymore. I can't talk in code. Remember, defendant told you he didn't talk in code on the wire. So she breaks character here in this call, BB. Then defendant later says to her the quote I already gave you about how they're in this together. They're one in the same. And I couldn't agree more with that statement. This slide is a composite of all the places where a defendant says, if he had information about the murder, he would collect the reward money. First of all, whichever side of this case, whichever theory you're finding credible, both sides agree that the defendant knew the whole time who killed Dan Markell, or close to the whole time. So definitely could have gone and gotten the reward money Although it's hard to imagine he would collect reward money for information about the death of his own loved one. What is Rashbaum doing back there? It's like he makes like a face and a gesture. Wait, did I see that right? Hold on. <laughs> this is so funny going back. Let me just look at this again. She's like, no matter who, which side of the case you're on, we both agree that the defendant knew right away who killed Dan Markell. And he kind of like makes a small face and a gesture. It says, if he had information about the murder, he would collect the reward money. First of all, 
whichever side of this. Keep your eye on Dan Rashbaum. Okay, so whichever theory you are finding credible, both sides agree that the defendant knew the whole time who killed Dan Markell, or close to the whole time. So definitely could have gone and gotten the reward. He's like, he just makes a face like, sort of, you got that kind of half right, Georgia. Just wait, just wait, Jory, till my amazing puzzle pieces. Five hours too long. No, it's not five hours. I'm just exaggerating <laughs> for comic value. But it was only a, a, an hour 45. It really felt like two and a half hours. It was so tedious, so tedious and uh, ridiculous. I found it that way. But of course, I'm not the audience for that, for that closing. I didn't find this defense at all, at all successful in any way. Reward money, although it's hard to imagine he would collect reward money for information about the death of his own loved one. Defendant claims he do doesn't go to the police, period. And he offers an example of I had a jet ski stolen and I didn't go to the police. Well, maybe the insurance was worth more than the trouble of the cops. I don't know. But he has gone to the police before. There was evidence of that. And, and the evidence shows that when somebody messes with him, he comes at them with everything he has. On the lawsuit with Ryan Fitzpatrick, the incident with his child's mother, incident with an old roommate, incident with a former female employee. Some of those included reports to law enforcement. Some of them included other use of other resources. In the last case with the female employee, he sent a letter that said, that said you know, she's, he accused her of trying to shake him down. So she's trying to extort him. And it states that he would never pay her a dime. In fact, I'm going to get attorney's fees. He's a guy with considerable resources, and he's not a shrinking guy. He is not afraid to use those resources to his advantage. If some street thug was trying to push him around, do you think he'd lay down and take that without doing one thing about it? This slide is a composite of some of the occasions defendant mentions the option of going to the police. And these quotes are specifically in reference to him saying, if you're threatened, you go to the police. If you're threatened, you go to the police. And he has done that before, but he did not go to the police in this case. He didn't go to the police in 2014, not out of fear, as he would have you believe, but because he did this crime. He believed he had gotten away with this crime. He didn't go in 2015 because he was busy that year having the best year of his life. Financially, got in a serious relationship with a new girl, June and Chinda. Cruised the intercoastal in his boat. This dude had solved the problem. Everyone was happy. Wendy and the boys were back in South Florida where they belonged. Mom was happy. He was making money hand over fist. June described the beginning of their relationship. June Umchinda described the beginning of her relationship with this defendant in October of 15 as a fairy tale. He is not sweating anything, folks. How much do you love that, George? It's like June Umchinda described her relationship with this defendant, this guy, this guy over here, this pale <laughs> guy who looks like he's going to puke in the, at the defense table. Like a fairy tale, if you could believe that. Things were good, but <laughs> but not for nothing. That defendant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> said that relationship was like with that defendant was like a fairy tale. Funny, funny. And that continued until the time of the bump in this case in April 2016 whereby the defendant became agitated, angry, and anxious. This was before the report concerning him was leaked. At the time of the bump, his behavior changed noticeably. June noticed it, and Ryan Fitzpatrick noticed it as well. He was erratic. Now, why on earth would he be more stressed out after his extortionists were arrested? He seemed perfectly fine to these witnesses when he would have you believe he was in fear for his life. 
And then he further told you that he was more nervous after the arrest because he feared he'd be falsely arrested. Why? You didn't do anything wrong. You're not going to get arrested. Now, yeah, after the report gets leaked, okay. But why are you so nervous before that? Or were you a hot mess because you knew that we were getting closer? Here's Catherine Magbanawa and the defendant discussing if the undercover could be someone who's trying to be an informant. An informant for what, if not the death of Dan Markell? He's not going to be an informant on the defendant getting extorted, a crime he has not reported. Here they're talking about whether the... Georgia, have you not considered that there might be a small man living in Charlie's closet that's that's running his mouth about the extortion plot? <laughs> this is so crazy. He's sunk. The undercover is getting his information from the inside or the outside. The inside means someone within the murder conspiracy, someone on that board, or the outside, somebody that one of those people told. Magbanoa says it can only be one of two, apparently. If somebody's that desperate, not from the inside, because there's too much from the inside that the person knows from the outside, so they won't risk it. That's why I know for a fact it's not from the inside. <laughs> and then Adelson says, it's somebody not from the first layer, but probably the second layer. Yeah, and they just made a big mistake, she says. As the wire goes on and the defendant proceeds to continue to analyze the additional bump efforts that law enforcement makes, that text message, the letter, the call to the Adelson Institute, he becomes increasingly confident that this would-be extortionist is an undercover agent. And then after listening to Donna's call to the undercover, he is completely sure of that. And you have never seen anybody so elated to be under investigation by the FBI for first-degree murder. Consider this in light of defendants' assertions that he was acting strangely after the bump because he was worried about being falsely arrested. To the contrary, he doesn't seem worried at all. He seems thrilled. I think he says it's fantastic in one of these calls. I want to turn briefly to your jury instructions. The defendant is charged with conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation to commit murder, and first degree murder. Why all three? Because the defendant didn't just ask Catherine Mag and I want to do this and promise her money. He didn't just set a plan of action in place toward doing it. It got done. It got done. And that's what makes it a murder. That's the difference between just conspiring. You didn't just conspire. It got done. This is the difference between just soliciting or just conspiring and being a principal to first degree murder. How much do you want to bet that that text mes message that Rashi just answered, that that was Donna? That was Donna texting him like, this is terrible. This is terrible. It's just one coincidence. She's dumbing down coincidences. <laughs> the jury, I hope the jury isn't listening to this nonsense. Right? Something like that. Did you see him just pick up his phone and put it down really quickly right away? And yeah, whoever pointed out that he's sitting further and further away from him, he's like, has his whole back turned to his client, to Charlie Adelson. And he's gone from the finger sniffing. Now it's just the beard, a nervous beard pulling. It's over for these guys, just over. To prove the crime of first degree murder, I must prove to you that this was premeditated. Premeditation is defined as killing after consciously intending to do so. This murder, consciously deciding to do so. All right, so this murder was in the works for over a year. It began with the failed relocation efforts. When defendant first looked into hiring a hitman, it took root when he enlisted Catherine McBanawa and she thereby brought in Garcia and Rivera to do the killing. The planning that went into the killing was extensive, spanning over a year, and it included the solicitation of Magbanoa to find someone to do the murder, 
the preparation of that letter and that envelope that were placed in Catherine Ibano's diaper bag, three of DNA or prints containing the directions for a murder that was delivered to the hired gun, Secreta Garcia. Three, the payments, payments that were made in advance for renting the vehicles in the hotel room, the expenses associated with those trips. That was part of the planning. Four, the scouting and stalking of Professor Markell that we learned went on in that both trips. And five, the pressure that defendant applied to Catherine Nivanola after that first attempt failed. Get it done, get it done, get it done. Six, of course, is the payment itself. He paid for it. All the planning, all the meetings, all the precautions were coming to fruition when that hired gun fired those two shots that devastated so many lives on July 18th. 2014. When you think about how this case was proven, we started at a single point, the crime scene, and we went in two totally different directions. We chased the Prius. Not for nothing, but what is that banging about? Is, is that the ghost of Dan Markell saying Georgia is right on for the right on? Don't even think about acquitting this guy? Who is making that extremely loud banging in the back? That's what I want to know. But look at Charlie Adelson, eyes closed. Doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to see it. Pro I don't know, what do you think he's telling himself? Like, I was great, I got a 95, and my it, this has got to go my way. Rashi's going to come back, and he's going he's gonna to kill it on closing. That's what he does. He's a closer. And Donna... Right? Donna says she wouldn't change one thing, one thing about Rashi's closing or anything he did in this trial. Anything he did. Yes, and we chased the motive, the bad blood of the in-laws. And the investigation could have stalled if any of these, if either of these leads had resulted in a dead end. But all the little breadcrumbs led to the same place. The Prius led to Garcia and Rivera, which led to Nagbanoa. The bad blood and the divorce led to the Adelson family. The wire confirmed the defendant's specific involvement, not just some Adelson, that Adelson. Then Rivera and eventually Magbanoa confirmed his involvement as well. I want to spend a moment talking about the principal instruction. We talked about this in jury selection. The defendant didn't pull the trigger, but that doesn't mean he isn't just as responsible as the person who did. Without every player in this conspiracy, the murder doesn't get done. In your jury instructions, it says there are two ways to prove defendant's guilt under the law of principles. If he intended that the murder be done and he did some act, preparing the paper, procuring Magbanoa, or said some word, get it done, get it done, get it done, that caused or helped another to commit the crime, then he is guilty of first degree murder. Or, two ways you can find it. Or, if he intended the murder to be done, and he made or promised payment in exchange for the murder, and the crime was committed by another person, he's guilty of first degree murder. So did you hear that? Um, so what I'm thinking about is Wendy here. So to go back, there are two ways. So did Wendy get, so if Wendy gave, say, Dan's whereabouts to help this murder along, that would be one way. That's what I'm thinking. And then, of course, you have to prove that maybe some of her money, maybe her stack in Harvey's safe went to this. Was this all paid by Donna? So, kind of difficult to prove conspiracy to commit murder with the evidence we have against Wendy right now. Lesser charge, maybe. But very interesting to know what's on Donna's phone, especially the text mess messages I'm very interested in because 
my experience, people tend to relax with their text messages and think nobody will read them. And I would think that this family after the bump would be very careful with what they say, as we've seen with even the jailhouse calls, even off the, even when she thinks she's off the line, some of what she says, um, if I'm remembering right, is not all that explicit. They're still kind of talking around the, around the issue. I want her to see all this, right? You don't know what this is exactly. My burden today is to prove to you this case beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury instructions tell you that a reasonable <coughs> doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. So when you're stuck back there deliberating, ask yourself, what is reasonable? When you're weighing a piece of evidence and deciding, like, is this a doubt or not? Is it reasonable? Does it fit with the other evidence in the case? If you find yourself saying, what if, or a fellow juror saying, what if, without evidence to support whatever it is that comes after the what if, that's speculation. Remind your fellow jurors to get back on track. And that cannot be a reasonable doubt if it's speculation. My burden is to prove the elements of the listed offenses. Nothing more. If you have a question that I have failed to prove the answer to, but it's not one of these elements of the crime that the judge has given you, that is not a reasonable doubt. I'm concerned that you'll get back there and think, well, he didn't pull the trigger, so let's just do conspiracy and solicitation. You guys have worked too hard to render a compromised verdict at this point. I trust that each of you will follow the law and your oath to render a wise and legal verdict in this case. This defendant is guilty of first degree murder under the principal theory, if ever anyone has been. So the efforts to distract you from this case and what it's really about, including these clear links in this conspiracy and all the evidence that establishes them, the text, the calls, the records, the testimony of Rivera, the testimony of Agbano, all those things together. The wiretap, the phone calls, the iCloud messages, and the absence of any other reasonable explanation should all lead you to one conclusion. This is the puzzle. This is the puzzle. The image is clear. When I confronted Rivera with the defense theory that he and Garcia acted alone to kill Martel and then extorted money out of the dentist through Magbanawa, he found it laughable. I wrote down his quote, ha, huh, that's a good one. It came out in, in this trial that in Garcia's trial, Rivera was portrayed as the, the sole killer, the bad guy. He conspired directly with Charlie Adelson, according to Garcia, to commit the murder through WhatsApp or some whatever, some kind of way. Garcia's lawyer said, Look at that. Look at Charlie right at the end of George's closing. So look at that face. How would you caption that? Whew. And this insistence in these trials that he's handsome, come on. I mean, maybe if he had a good personality, it, it would add to it, but he's so repellent in all ways, I find. Said this was all done without the knowledge and participation of Garcia. Then we like a soulless ghoul. That's what that's what I see. Learned in Magbano's trial, Garcia supposedly conspired directly. Yeah, now, here we are in the trial of Charlie Adelson, and the truth has been revealed. Once again, the state got this almost right. That's what you heard in the opening from Mr. Rashbaum. We understandably thought Garcia, I mean, sorry, we understandably thought that his client, Mr. Adelson, was the hirer of this murder, but there's a twist. Nothing is as it appears to be. 
The defendant is really the second victim in all of this. Per his theory, the killers drove to Miami twice to kill someone they'd never met and had no motive to kill in hopes that Charlie Adelson would, one, not report them for murder, and two, would instead agree to give them large amounts of cash at that time and on a payment plan over the next, I don't know, years. Kudos to Georgia for not saying, like, whoever is banging their leg on the bench in front of them, I think that's what it sounds like. I, it was hugely distracting in the closing for not saying anything. But look at Charlie nodding when she's going through the defense's theory. He's like nodding along. Like, that's what happened. That's what happens. If I nod along, maybe the jury will see me and, and, uh, and maybe they'll vote to acquit. Desperate, desperate. Other than failing the smell test, the, there are a few specific problems with the defense theory. One, how would the killers have known where to go to kill Markel? How would they know who to kill? How could the killers have known that Dan Markel was scheduled to leave town the day after the murder? Three, possibly the biggest problem, the theory itself makes no sense. Were they just hoping that this would work? We're going to go all the way out there and kill somebody and maybe they'll give us some money. They were going to confess to doing the murder to Charlie Adelson in order to try to get money. Why not just put a gun to his head and take his money? Why not just rob and or extort him with the threat of death by Latin King? That would save you the trip and the murder rap. Their jigsaw puzzle theory is just a pile of pieces that don't fit together. Each explanation is carefully designed to explain one piece of evidence. But how many different explanations can you string together before it's no longer reasonable? How many coincidences can there be before it's no longer a coincidence? This defendant is not a victim. Apparently infinite. According to Donna and Charlie, there could be infinite number of coincidences. Then, then you should acquit any any explanation at all. Acquit. Reasonable doubt counts as reasonable doubt. He's a criminal. He's wealthy. He's smart. This defendant is not a victim. He's a criminal. He's wealthy. He's smart. And he's successful but he's a wealthy, smart, successful murderer. My work is almost done here and yours is just beginning. I trust that each, each of you will do your best to render a wise and legal verdict in this case, a verdict that speaks the truth, a just verdict. And that is a verdict of guilty as charged. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome closing by Georgia Kappelman. Thank you for watching that with me. Wow, 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 and more wow. And I think we all know what happened. If out oh, spoiler alert, if you if you <laughs> if you've been living under a rock or not following this case, this is this is how it how it went down. Everyone but the four person can be seated. Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, Your Honor. If you please could hand the verdict form to the bailiff. The verdict form is in its proper order. Madam Clerk, please publish the verdict. In the circuit court of the Second Judicial Circuit in and for Leon County, Florida, the state of Florida versus Charles Adelson, case number 2016, CF 3036B, verdict. Count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the indictments, first degree murder. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Count two. We, the jury, find as follows 
as to count two of the indictment, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. The defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Count three. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three of the indictment, solicitation to commit first degree murder. The defendant is guilty of solicitation to commit first degree murder. So say we all this sixth day of November, 2023. Okay, so thanks for listening, everyone. Happy New Year. Please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this episode. Trying to do all the good <laughs> self-promotion things I'm so bad at. If you're listening on podcasts, please leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and I will see you back here Wednesday. Have a great night, everybody.